Everyone now, can we mute our mic? We just have two minutes. Hello, Mr. Yodichi. Hello. Yeah, please, I think there is an echo. Who is speaking there? This is um, Kayo de Alamutu. I think there is an echo. Hello? Okay, it's better now. You're doing good. Can we switch up our video now? We're going to start with prayer. I welcome you to this awesome time. Other people can join us later. Yeah. And because of the training, the, the lecture is supposed to take a period of 40 minutes, and there will be a QA session for 15 minutes. And we have five minutes of interlude for, for preparation of next class. I, I encourage you to get a good network, get a good relaxing position, enjoy the best of this webinar. If the webinar promised to be a huge blessing and it promised to really inspire, to enlighten, to encourage, and uh, to, to get us refired for the for the, in the industry that we are. And I sincerely appreciate all of you for trusting and to organize this and responding in such a manner that you responded. And um, please let your mind be off at all time through the course of the lecture. Bear in mind that this training is being recorded. So let's ask professionally. We are, we are a professional organization. When it's time for us to ask you to mute your, or mute your mic and on your video, you can. So that, but for the purpose of for the period of this section, kindly mute your video and mute your mic so that we don't allow for distraction. The question and answer time. Before we proceed, why introduce our first job for today? I want us to start this awesome thing with prayer within 30 seconds. Father, we thank you for this great privilege. We honor, we honor you, we bless you. We give you all the praise of God. We pray that every one of us that is connected to this webinar, to this call, we are blessed. We are, we are strengthened. We receive insights, information that we have and improve our industry. And we get better on our work on every side. And our nation, Nigeria, and the world become better because of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Now, it's 10 o'clock. Brian Jung, good to see you. Hi, hello. Good to see you. Brian Jung is the... Is good to see you. He's the um, Korea Overseas Director over several decades in the business of uh, chemical manufacturing. You know, they have, they have several dozen scores several lines of products in the in, 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 in pest control products, different formulation, disinfection products, with several years dominating the market from Korea to the world. 
So we are glad to, to see you today, to have you join us, Mr. Brian, and your team from Korea. I know at this time, it is evening, late evening in, in Korea. It is early morning in Lagos, Nigeria. It was good to have you. We are glad to have you, and thank you for always being there. We are open to get the best of this training, and every one of us are open. Other facilitators will join us on the course of the training. The floor is yours now, Mr. Brian. Welcome. Welcome to the Fortune to this course, that we course on communication and disinfection. Thank you for having you this morning. Thank you. Welcome. The floor is yours now. Mr. Brian, did you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can I can hear you. Um I take up the first class now. Over to you. Could you hello? Hello, yes. I can hear you. Uh, Let me make you, I'm gonna make you could you display the um, materials I sent the fortune? So I've made you a course I mean, presentation. So that you can actually share your slide. Mr. Brian? Yes. Yeah, I've made you a course so you can actually share your slide from your from your location. You can barely hear you, sir. Jude, you can barely hear me. Are you sure it's peculiar to you or is everybody? Hmm? I can barely hear him. Is there anybody having the same audio issue? No, you are you are quite audible I here. I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you clearly. Okay, I think. Hello, um, could you could you show the presentation material um I sent the fortune a few days ago? Off your video, everybody put up your video, put up your audio. Put up your video, everybody put up your video so that we don't have too much of uh, really the host and the host should put up the video. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Brian, we are with you. Uh, the fortune, I think he's having issues with his uh, sharing. He asked you to share the screen for him. Uh, uh, yeah, let me see how possible that is from here. to get the screen out now. The, the, the connection is, is something else here. Yeah.
Mr. Brian, just confirm to me if you can still get my audio in any way. Because I think the network is good where I am. I think. Hello, I have it. Mr. Brown? Yes. Okay, we can hear you now. Your audio is coming out. Can you share your screen? Sorry? Are you able to share your screen? Um, can, can, you, um, can you share show, um, the materials I sent, sent you? Okay. Uh, yes, I've shared I can, the material cannot... with the student. With the... I can show you my, my presentation materials. So you should um, arrange the materials. Um, at your side. I'm going to see. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Defoe, I had to mute everybody. So you can just unmute Mr. Brian now so that he can continue. The noise was too much. Okay. This is right. Defoe, yeah, you hear me? Um, can you show the presentation material for the for the meeting? Um, I sent you a few days ago. You are muted, the fortune. Yeah. So please. Yeah. yeah. I'm working on the slide. Just continue with the presentation. It will pop up that way. But I've said hey, all the participants have the the, uh, the material already. There are various. Uh, so, but just continue. I will, it will come up on the screen shortly. So, the fortune just just can I um, start without without yes. um, materials? Yes, can you go, go ahead? So everybody can can see the um, materials I sent. Yes, they already have it. We forwarded it to everybody. Okay, but um, I'm still going to okay. share it. Yes. Okay, I see. Okay, um, hello everybody. Nice nice to meet you. Um. I'm Brian, working at um, Jisen Hygiene in Korea. Um, I'm I'm pleased to have an opportunity to to introduce our product at the professional fumigation and disinfection technology um, this morning. Hoping that my session can be helpful in in understanding all of the business circumstances in this um, business. Next.
Okay, um, let me start with a um, brief introduction of the companies associated with the business. Um, Jason Heisen is, is, is the sales and marketing oriented company for both Kukpo Science and Samjong. And Kukpo Science specializes in manufacturing pesticide products such as insecticide, rodenticide, larvicide disinfectant and sanitizer and pet care. And Samjong is GMP approved company produces personal care product like toothpaste, repellent, mouthwash and hair shampoo. So all in all, um, we are covering from pesticide to pet care and personal care product. In actuality, we are expanding our, our product in the areas we are, we are doing business with. So always come in and get muted when you are coming in. Don't distract this meeting. Mr. Brian, can you unmute yourself and uh, continue? Thank you. Go to next. And we have around 100 customers all over the world and we are delivering our product um, over 50 countries, mainly insect side and rodent side at the moment. And we have customers in Asia like Japan, China, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and, and Middle East, and Africa, and Latin America as well. Go to next. And I have three products today um, to, to present all of you, um, which are are for roaches, cockroaches, and, and rats and mice, and mosquitoes. And here comes some um, cockroaches first. Okay, next. And the cockroaches are an Asian group originating during the Carboniferous period some 300, 350 million years ago. They are common and hard insects capable of tolerating a wide range of climate. Now go back to former slide. Tolerating a wide range of climate from Arctic cold to tropical heat. Roche, roche influences human badly, like they, they eat human and pet food and can live on offensive odor. And they can passively transport more than seven microbes on their body surfaces. They link with um, allergic reactions in humans. Rarely they crawl into human ears and cause pain and hearing loss and they transfer above 30 bacteria and viruses and carry at least six eggs of worms. They are known to spread disease like dysentery, E. coli, salmonella, food poisoning, asthma, poliovirus, and Hansen disease. Next. Go to next. And there are main three, no, formal, back to formal slide. 
And there are um, main three cockroaches that irritate humans' lives around the world. And, and which are German cockroaches and black cockroaches and American cockroaches. The size of German cockroach is 15 to 12 to 15 mm, and they they prefer 15 to 35 um, Celsius, degrees Celsius, and they live six to nine months. And black cockroaches with with the size of 25 and 30 mm, and they prefer 20 to 30 Celsius, degrees Celsius and they last 12 to 18 months and they don't fly. And the largest one is American cockroaches with, with the size of 28 to 43 mm. They live 20 to 18 months usually and they can fly. And go to next. Go to next. Would you please show next next slide? Yeah, we use um fifenonil for cockroach bait gel Gupo Ultra. This um, chemical formula is C12H4Cl2F6 and 4OS. And in, it is broad spectrum insecticide. It has quick killing effect. It's um, panel pressure chem chemical family. Its disruption of insect nervous system causes hyper excitation of insect nerves and muscles. It's effective various pests like ant, termite, flea, and ticks. It has no resistance to, to cockroaches. It's, it's a moderate hazardous pesticide, WHO class two. Go to next slide. As you can see um, at the, at the graphs, is it has 99% mortality in for German cockroaches and 97 mortality, mortality for American cockroaches in 14 days. It is um, effects in 24 hours after installation. Is the product is EPA approved which number is 88613-1. Go to next slide. Go to the next. Yeah, let me explain how to use the bait um, when, you, when you need it. You can place bait where cockroaches appear frequently, such as crevices, holes, or corners. And you can put an amount of 0 0.55 gram per one square meter. You can increase the amount of bait in places where high population of cockroaches shows. You can notice the number of roaches will be decreased to, to three days after its installation. You don't need to remove the install bait, even though cockroaches are not seen. And you can replace, you should replace old bait with new ones every three months. And you can use bait stations if necessary. It will be helpful in installing bait easily on target spot. You can fill one gram of bait in each inside each station, and you can install on walls and and when places you want because there is the bottoms of stations. There is a 
autistic scare and, and that can stick anywhere, any places you want. Go to next slide. And this shows locations where the bait must go. You can place the bait at hiding spot like crevice, herbert, drain, or dark and wet corners near washing machine, dishwasher, refrigerator, microwave, oven, gas stove, sink table, closet, drawer, cupboard. And you can, you can apply the bait around you like living room, bathroom, kitchen, bedroom, and, and, and or business facilities like offices, hotels, hospitals, schools, restaurants. So you can cover almost every residential or living spaces. And we, we are supplying the product to 18 countries like Nigeria, Tunis, Egypt, Libya, South Africa, South Arabia, Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, India, Thailand, Malaysia, like something like that. And there are other chemicals for cockroach bait gel, which one is hydrometronum, imidacloprid, indoxacarb. Hydrometronum is three flow metal amino hydrogen class, and it has metabolic inhibitor and slow acting poison. And imidacloprid compri comprise of C9, H10, C Cl and 5O2 and in neonicotinide class. And it has blockage of central nervous system. And indoxa curve is in oxidizing class and cause blockage of neutral sodium channels. Go to next slide. Okay, let's move on to insect side called defrocin phlogmaphon. Go to next slide. As everyone knows well, um, rats and mice can serve as genetic factors and thus spread disease like robotic plague, fear of bacteria and is symptoms like flu, like fever, headaches, vomiting, swollen, painful, lymph nodes, and they spread Lassa fever and leptos, leptospirosis and dermatitis via blood feeding what in mites. It causes inflammation of the skin, itchiness, redness, rash, something like that. Go to next. We use phlogmuffin um, as the active ingredient for the fortune phlogmuffin. Its chemical formula is C233H125034 F304. It adequately control rodent resistant to first generation coagulants. It performs in practice to most populations. It's generally less toxic to non target species than to rats. It turns out to be as efficient than other chemicals. It results in 100% mortality in house mice. It has the effect of blocking of vitamin K cycle. It causes damage to tiny blood vessels and causes inability to produce essential blood clotting factors. It has 30% mortality in three days, 50% in four days, and 90% in six days. 
and 100% in seven days. Go to next slide. We have we supply to two forms of product to Deep Fortune, um, like Palette and Wax Blow, with the zero point zero five percent active ingredient. For indoor, you can use pallet with three to four grams per square meter. For outdoors, you can place wax block at a distance of every five to 10 meter where rats and mice sign out. You can use stations when installing wax block around structures or buildings. The center of the wax block, there is a hole and you can you can put the wax blocks into rod and you can install rod into inside stations. And you can move the station to, to near the buildings and structure and rats and mice can go into station and eat bait and go out the station and die in the bright side. Go to the next slide. We supply those products to 10 countries like Morocco, South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Bahrain, Iraq, Jordan, Singapore, Taiwan, Philippines, and Brazil. Go to the next slide. And there are other chemicals for rodent side, which one is anticoagulant like Kumatetrale, Diphenacum, Brodifacum, and Bromadeum. And metal phosphide like zinc phosphide or ALP. It causes reaction between phosphide and the acid in the digestive system of the rodent, which generates the toxic phosphate gas. And other chemical poisons are like um, arsenic toxide and BACO3 and fluoroacetamide. Go to the next slide. And lastly, I will I touch flying insect killer for, for many mosquitoes. Um, SMC Delta John product. Next. Due to the mosquitoes, at least 2 million people die annually. Mosquitoes can, can act as vectors for, for many disease causing viruses and parasites. So it causes viral disease like yellow fever, dengue fever, chicken cunia, and parasitic disease like malaria and, and cause bacteria disease like tula, Tularemia and heartworm disease, lymph lymphatic flourishes, West Nile virus, and Zika. Go to next. We use Delta Medrin for, for the product of MC Delta Zone. The its chemical formula is C22H18, Bl2, and NO3. It, its pyrethroid is an insecticide which is highly effective. Its main vector control recommended by WHO for the, for the management of malaria. It prevents 100 million of cases of malaria globally, and it helps in eliminating and preventing a wide variety of household pests like spiders, flea, ticks, ants, and bad bugs. Go to next. 
the technology for, for the AMS delta zone we use is capture suspension. It makes tiny particles or drones surrounded by a coating to give small capsules less than one micrometer. A range of 0.1 to 5% active ingredient must be solvalized in surfactant in which reaches to achieve a long-term stable formulation. It's very stable, so more dynamically, and it benefits not only to reduce dosing frequently, but to prevent the uh, degradation. As you can see in the picture, the oil, the water phase in the oil phase, and with some agitation, it, it becomes metabolic drumness and with, with um, 200 RPM for 24 hours, four hours agitations, it becomes polymer drumness. And you can apply this product by diluting the product with waters. As you can see the table, you can, you should dilute the product with, with waters. For flies, one liter product should be diluted in with 249 liter water. For mosquito, one liter product should be diluted in with 329 liter water. And for cockroaches, its dilution rate is 149 water. And you can spray diluted solutions with a sprayer. And there are many types of sprayer in the market. You can use um, truck mounted sprayer for fast moving and convenient application. Go to next slide. We supply this product MC Delta zone to 12 countries like South Africa, Nigeria, Bahrain, Kuwait, Jordan, Singapore, Taiwan, Philippines, Hong Kong, Chile, Spain, and Russia. Go to next. And there are several chemicals for flying in the killer, um, like Lambda cyhalothrin, promethrin, cypermethrin, bifenthrin, and, and the phenothrin. Lambda cyhalothrin is composed of C23, H19, Cl, FNO3. It causes disruption of nervous system and has knockdown properties. And promethrin is C12, C21. H20 and Cl2 or 3. And, and cypermethrin has fast killing neurotoxic in, in insects. And bifenthrin causes influence on nervous system and effect against a wide range of crawling insects. And diphenethrin is, is primar, pr primarily used to kill trees and ticks. Go to next. Yeah, it's all I'd like to share with you today. Um, so keep clean and stay healthy. We are always around you. If you have any questions, please contact the fortune in Nigeria. I'll make a full support behind them. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you so very much, uh, Brian. I know you were rushing for the time. <laughs> time is very, even though we know that uh, for Zoom, a few minutes of your time, but it's not a good time. I know it's, uh, it's our briefs, briefs, captures of some details and uh, a 
Okay, let me just open the floor for question and answer because it is then that uh, people will be able to ask uh, and be able to enlighten us and put in our knowledge on some of these things. Okay, if you, if you want to ask a question or ask Brian any question about this topic, we have to, we need to do that. But you need to just raise your hand by six, get your question. Please don't, don't interrupt the meeting. We are not recognized to speak. Just let us see it by indication of hand. Just raise your hand and speak you, then you can ask the question in your mind so that we can have a free flow session of this morning. Thank you. I'm waiting. I'll see you later. Okay. Uh, choose also want to ask a question, and I quickly recognize you. I need your mic and ask a quick ask Mr. Brian a question. Guys, ask a question now. Ask yes. about flutomaphine. Ask a, all those things, other things about general affairs. Just ask a question now. Where we have the, the president himself. Yeah. Okay. Um, choose also. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Uh, nice presentation. So, but my question is um, the flow Kumafen, the fortune flow Kumafen we have here, the ones I've seen actually are, are in pellet form. We have the block forms here too, that's one. Then the Delta zone, is they available in Nigeria at the moment. Mr. Brian, did you get that? It's asking yeah, I can hear you. The block form of a flow machine. Will you, will you mind responding to that question? The body, the market is asking for block form. They said, he said, he has used the pellet, is good, but they need a block. Over to you, Mr. Brian. Sorry, um, I, I can clearly hear you, um, so could you, okay. could you repeat okay. again? The question from Choose was, um, for example, the Flokumafin, he has used the pellet form that we have in Nigeria, mm -hmm. so, but he's asking for the block, the block formulation, that how can they get that, or how soon can that be available for them? That's the question. So, so, I don't understand clearly um, what, what, what point um, you want to know from, from block, block form. Do you want that block based um, product or what, what your question? Actually, the, the um, line is not, not good. So, so I'm sorry, I, I can clearly understand you. Okay, it's actually asking for the block form of uh, the fortune flow machine. I know yeah. we talked about this some few weeks ago about the block form. So he's asking that how soon can we get that in Nigeria? That is question. How, how you can get? Um, we are supplying to to um the fortune, and 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 um actually they um. They are planning to order order the product, and um, you can you can get the product um, probably in 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 within within two or three months, if you want. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Choose, he's saying that within two three months we can have the block form block uh, formulation. That's the same question. Let's go to the self question. Can you allow me to can you quickly on it? Let's get your question to Mr. Chills. We have a few more minutes to cover. Okay. Um hello, Mr. Brian. Um Kayo de Alamutu. And I want to ask a question as regards as regards the MC Delata zone. Okay. Um in the slide, I saw something saying um that we should spray with. We should spray the diluted solution with a sprayer. So I just want to confirm if it's just a sprayer that can be used in the um, application. Maybe we could use other means of of um, of disinfecting. Maybe via a fog machine or something. 
So yeah, that's my question. Yes, you can you can use the product um, with spray with um, spray or um, um, forming forming machine as well. Um, I mean forking forking machine as well. So it it you can use in both um, direct spray or forking. Okay, so, thank you, thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you. That's good. Like it can both be spray before. Thank you for that. Okay, Muy day. By all means, can we ask get your question? After we we still need more people to indicate. There may be two more so that we we'll probably cover the time. Muy day. Can we ask get your question? By all means. Okay. Okay, you want to type your question, you can type. If you have a question, you can type it, you can read it out. But if you want to omit your mic to ask, just kindly do. This session is going to wrap up in the next few minutes. So let's get the best as let's let's get as many questions as possible. Nathaniel or Zoya, can you omit and ask a question? We didn't put your question in the chat. Anyone that wants to put a question? Nathaniel. Good morning. Everyone, Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brown, for that presentation. Really wonderful one. My question is: I want to ask the Kumbu Ultra this treatment for cockroaches. I want to ask Mr. The, 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 the fortune, sir, please. Do we have it in Nigeria? And uh, if possible, do you do you have it? Can we get it from you? Okay, if I may respond to that, um, at the function, we started working with Brian, I think about four years ago now, five years ago. Most of this product that you see him listed there, we've got we've got NAVDA approval for them already, both for Kubo Ultra, MC Delta. In fact, that MC Delta there, that the, is a micro capsulated formulation. It's different from the HST SC formulation that we are. That's why I mentioned something about capsule formulation. You know, it's an advanced formulation that I'm really excited about. So I only have the samples there for my personal use for now, but very soon we hope that uh, we'll be able to have them in commercial quality in the market. But we have the NAVDAT documentation approved for them yet. NAVDAT has tested. In fact, NAVDAT went to Korea and they, they spent like two, three days with Mr. Brand in South Korea assessing the product and, uh, and they gave approval for it. So very soon, let's be optimistic that uh, as we have all these forest issues, we will be able to and ask Mr. Brian to support us to get the product in for us. Mr. Brian, people need this product. Come on. Let's yeah. make this product popular here. So people are asking for MC Delta, asking for Kubo Ultra, asking for block form of block nothing. So over to you, Mr. Brian. Yeah. Human Kupo Ultra is um fifronil fifronil based um cockroach um bait. Okay. Yeah, did you get the, the question from her? Uh, he was talking about he was talking about availability of the product in the market, like MC Delta, Kubo Ultra and the blog from the blog market, that how soon can we get them available? The same question that Chris was asking. So my own addendum to it is, we need you to support us to get these products into the market. I'll be glad Yes, um, we, we are producing um, um, all, of, all of the, all, all of three products. Um, this our, those are our, um, a major product. So if if you place um, orders anytime, yeah, we can we can deliver and supply you. As okay. I explained in the slide, um, we are supplying those products on many countries. So so we are we are um, always producing those products. We are ready. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Any time to produce. Okay. I hope you give Nigeria 
this give us priority. Give us priority. Okay, Adiola is your question answer. We didn't have you sent your question. Where is it starts? Let's get the last question from Mr. Brian before we allow Mr. Brian to go for today. You know, it's night in Korea. It's early morning here in Nigeria. So let's get it. One more question, please. We don't often get Brian you know, on calls. This is the <laughs> very privilege of being with this session, at least opening this session. So please let us let's drill in with some questions a bit. Can I see people's hands? Uh, there's a question. We didn't have two particular questions. You can omit your mic and just speak out. Mm. Did I assume that we will get everything? Hello. Hello. As hello, hello. 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 No, no, that's hello. Issue. Okay, Mr. Yusuf, can you ask a question? Yeah, some questions have been, you know, sent to the, to the chat. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Okay, let me Hello. know from the chat now. Yes. The question is, somebody is asking, I just joined the Zoom when the Q&A began. So I missed it, this, this part of the training. So could you please make the video available to enable us get the information? Yeah, for everyone that subscribed to this training, you will get access to the video. Okay, the, that's the training material. Second one is a, just a clarification, please. Other than Roche's treatment, what other infestation can we deploy the dead gel? Okay, uh, Mr. Brian, it's asking okay. as other than Roche treatment, can we use the bait treatment for any other kind of insect pest, like maybe termite, like any other thing? Can the fipronil or any other bait method be used for any of this category of pests aside from Roche's? Are you there, Mr. Brian? Um, the, I, I can hear your voice. Um, your your um your voice is is um cutting cut by um something. So so it's not it's not um smoothly delivered to me. So uh, could okay. You, the could question you was asking was that uh, the bait method as I liked it with Fubo Oxra, that can it be used to, to treat any other insect or pest aside cockroaches? But, but cockroaches, um, yeah, the Fubo Oxra is, is developed for any, any um, kind of, it's effective for any kind of cockroaches like um, German, German cockroaches and, and American cockroaches. German is which is small and American cockroach is, is the largest one. So it covers from small to large cockroaches. It's effective for all kinds of cockroaches around around human. Okay. So basically uh price is the formulation specifically for cockroaches. Ayo Jonathan, can you quickly ask a question? Ayo Jonathan. Ayo Jonathan, are you there? Did you ask me? Yeah, okay. I'm here. Yeah, okay, I'm Ayo, sorry. You... Um, uh, can you, can my, you... my question, hello? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My, my question is um, uh, you know, it seems that the, the Fortune um, First Solutions is a Lagos based company. I don't know, like, yeah, in Abuja, do they have a major distributor that is distributing it to here yeah, in Abuja? Like, I mean, the products. So we can, we can easily get um, access to them here in Abuja. Oh, okay. To answer that, the Fortune has an official office in Abuja. Wait yeah. more. Look very FCT. So after this okay. meeting, you can come. just contact us. We send you our office address and our manager's uh, contact number. So you can only see just All right. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question is: cockroach jet bed are made for cockroaches alone? Fine. 
And can the corporate jet be used in food manufacturing company? Mr. Mr. Brian, there's a question that said, can the corporate jet be used in food manufacturing company, like a kitchen or restaurant? Mr. Brian. Hello? Yeah, Mr. Brian, the question was, can, can the gel bait be used for a, a, a food facility, like a restaurant, a kitchen, a production facility? Yeah. Okay, can be used. Is there any safety protocol food. you may need to run us through? For those kind of restaurants or food, food facilities, um, you should be careful. Um, the product should be um, touched with the product. Should not be touched with the product um, because it's, it's a little, it, actually it's, it's a chemical. So um, yeah, um, you, you should be careful um, not to touch, not to, um, going to the food or, or or any any facilities um, um associate with the with the um food or restaurant. Thank you. I hope you got that that response. You said you need to be careful in application. Yes, it can be used in the food. That is what should be said. But you need to ensure that there is no cross contamination. The product doesn't touch your hand. That means you have to wear your proper PPE, your gloves in application. Then you don't let it touch the food. Those are the normal standards that we always know. Yeah, okay. We need to. So, can we now? I guess no other question. Come on, guys. Can we just unmute yourself everywhere you are? You can unmute your video as well. Let us just let us just um, let's Come say on. hi to Mr. Brian. Let's um, let's let him let him see our face before he, he leaves now. So, so guys, let's let's do that. Hello, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Oh, that was a good presentation. Hello. Thanks for the wonderful Hi. presentation. Hello. Hello. I love the presentation. It was a very awesome presentation. We have learned a lot. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much. You understand? Good to see all your faces. And I know Mr. Brian has seen all of you that truly, truly. Thank you for the session. Thank you so much. Okay, Mr. Brian, that's an appreciation message from every participant today. We look forward to having the blog for the in the in, in Nigeria market soon. We also look forward to having the Hello? MC Delta Zone. This is a fantastic product that we really need in our in our, in our area in Africa. Everybody on this call today, they are we are all professionals, PCOs, EMP, best management professionals in our various capacities, and uh, these are stakeholders the best control business in Nigeria. Section of Africa. So we really seek for more. We believe so much in Korean milk product because of the quality, because of the extra quality that Korean put into their product. And we want to seek for more collaboration. Then, products, many other areas with uh, distant and good. We are glad to have you. At this session to open this uh, training. This training continues to like we still have about three more participants for today. It's a privilege for us to have you open the session today. I want to say thank you, everyone. I appreciate you. Thank you. And in regards to all the team there, we hope that very soon. Last year I was supposed to be with you in Korea. I got my visa ready. Uh, COVID came. I, I had to abort the trip a day, a day before. 
In fact, I've paid for my ticket and everything already. I had to just because of COVID. I hope very soon COVID will, will, will leave us and uh, we'll be able to have transborder journeys and presentations. And we look forward to seeing you in Lagos, Nigeria very soon. And maybe we'll be with us physically to engage some of the PCOs, PMDs, and the one on one interactions. So that we can also tap into your over 30 years, almost 40 years worth of experience in production of pest control and hygiene products. We've seen so many countries all over the world America, Europe, Asia, Africa, basically everywhere your products are available all over the world. And in fact, now that the, the official regulator of Nigeria, when they, their report, when they came back to Nigeria from your factory, was that it's top notch. They visited your factory. They said the quality control is, is top notch. The processes is top notch. The product that effect, and it's evident in Pokemon Every product that has this Pokemon has rated the product as a very great product. So we look forward to a greater collaboration with you. And keep supporting us. You know, keep doing everything to support us. When we ask, just deliver to us. Thank you so very much, Mr. Brad. Hope to see you again in another session sometime in the, in the future. And any other questions that any of our past, any other participants here may be asking, we we'll compile those questions and we we'll send them to you. You know, to you. Thank you so very much once again, and thank you everyone for listening as we get ready for the next class. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Regards to everyone in Korea. Thank you. It's still my pleasure. Bye for now. Bye. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Can somebody? How was that session? Hello, everyone. Now, just briefly before we move into the next class, the pest control prof is so charged and ready for his class. Come on, guys. He's going to see the fire will keep increasing. I tell you. So, uh, okay, but before I go, before I go to the next person, can somebody just tell me what's your opinion about this class we just had? Can I just get the food back from someone? And now we can improve it. Just one person, single person, come to the next class. We have just one minute. I don't want to take this time. <laughs> Okay, nobody is saying anything. I think I need to meet everybody now. Okay, once again, welcome to the second session, the second body of today's of, of this uh, presentation. You know, it's, uh, it, was, it was a refreshing time with Brian there, and at least he brought us into some. You know, sometimes why I love to have these guys to come is that. When we are doing something locally here, you just want to be sure that what we are doing is in alignment with global best practice. And evidently, we have been, we are, Nigeria pest control industry is, has been really doing well. Evidently, everything is said is what we've been practicing. That means we are actually in line with the, with the global trend, global best practices. Very soon, we are going to face up all those guys that call fumigators, sprayers on the street, carry pump. It's a professional business and organization, so we need to make it so. We said we need to make it so. Now we're going to be having in the next. Now I'm introducing our very own pest control pro. Choose him also. He's going to be taking a course on principles of vector control and integrated pest management. This is a course that you'll be looking forward to. Every of these modules is charged and loaded, and I really want you to pay attention. He's going to be sharing his slides. We also make the slide available for us to go through later after the training. But please, look at your screen, enjoy the session, okay. write down your questions after the training. It's only a 40 minute session, so we can have a question and answer. And then we still have two facilitators after that. Right? So keep relaxed, get some tea, coffee, water, and get the bed. Best control pro, over to you. Welcome, pro. Yeah, yeah. I hope I'm audible enough. Very well. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here this wonderful um, Thursday morning. 
and I promise you we're going to have a wonderful time. But I will crave your indulgence. Uh, I would like for us to keep muted. Um, after I'm done with the delivery, there will be time for questions and uh, for interaction, just so that we can have a sane house. Wow. Already somebody has unmuted herself. So it's good for us to have a sane house and uh, so that we can all play together. <laughs> Hello, can we stay muted, please? Okay. Well, just submit yourself, Pro, so that you can continue. I need to... Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So, uh, like I was introduced, uh, my name is Chooks Mosu. I'm called Pest Control Pro. And that's because uh, I, I have a strong passion for the pest control industry. And I uh, help a lot of um, people to become well-rounded in the profession. All right, so we're going to be looking at uh, the principles of vector control and uh, integrated pest management, which we call uh, IPM. All right, I'm going to be uh, sharing my slide from uh, please the fortune. I want to slide share my slide from. Um, the my other handle there, prop chooks. I don't know if you if you've seen that. Please uh, give me privileges so that I can share from there. You see the FGF uh, logo, please grant me sharing privileges there so I can share from there. Okay, good. Tap to speak, don't speak it. Okay. Put of your mic, please. Put of your mic, everyone, please. Off your mic, off your mic, please. Put off your mic. Okay, so let's dive into the the meat of the whole thing. Okay, so that's my slide. Uh, the principles of vector control and um, integrated pest management. So but before we go into the nitty gritty of the whole thing, I will want us to acquaint ourselves with some quotes. And this quote will actually help us as we as we proceed in the in the course okay but before we do that i want us to have a mental picture of ourselves right have a mental picture of yourself as a doctor a, a, a pharmacist or a, a surgeon okay so with that mental picture in your head i need you to look at that quote by the left hand side of the screen that says as a pmp you are a physician and pharmacist put together you observe, diagnose, and prescribe drugs for the for and treat pest-related cases. Like a doctor and pharmacist, you dare not misdiagnose, misprescribe, or mistreat, for it is a matter of life and death. And like a doctor or pharmacist, you re your requisite knowledge largely determines your success rate. So. What I'm trying to say there is that going forward, see yourself as a very important personality in this pest control uh, business that we are in. So the same way doctors cater for their patients, the same way um, they treat sick people, that is about what we too are doing in this business. Okay, so it is a serious business. And Can't hear you, please. Can't hear you. Can't hear you, please. You can't hear me. Am I audible? We can hear you clearly. Maybe you should just, if you can't hear, just put a shot on the group so that we can see it. Instead of interrupting the session, maybe it's your microphone or your internet. We are all in different locations and, and, and the audio is very clear. Thank okay, you. so let, let me just proceed. Um, so the idea of the physical, of the uh, 
imaginary whatever I put up there is for us to know that what we do is actually very serious. And as we are going to be looking at uh, IPM, we're going to see the importance of that imagery that I, I asked us to, to do. All right, so uh, let me... Okay, I'm going to be sharing from here now because uh, my other system has gone off. All right, so the question, what exactly is uh, vector control? Vector control. Now, the word vector actually refers to... Just a moment, I'm looking for my screen. When we say vector control, we're talking about any method used to limit or eradicate mammals, birds, insects, or atropos, collectively called vectors, which transmit diseases and disease pathogens. So when we talk about uh, vector control, we're talking about uh, things like uh, ticks, like mosquitoes, like uh, sessafly, you know, those things that transmit disease from one person to another, all right? But in this part of the world, our major interest is actually mosquitoes. Yes. Uh, so we are going to be focusing on mosquito control today as we look at uh, vector control. I'm going to be sharing the slides with us uh, so that after now we can go back to them. But let me share an experience with you. Now, you see, the reason why I say you should imagine yourself as a doctor uh, is this. Sometime last year, we were called to do a job at a hotel, and majorly uh, service hotels. And the reason is that um, um, word has gone around that uh, I know how to deal with mosquitoes. Right. So that hotel called us to service them, and they've been having issues with uh, mosquitoes. A lot of pest control practitioners have come; they've re they've given their solution, but there hasn't been any respite at all. So what we did when we entered the scene was, first of all, we asked them for, um, you know, the evidence of the treatments that other practitioners have been uh, giving them in the form of certificates, in the form of uh, reports and all that. So from the certificates they gave us, we were able to understand that most of these operators have been using the same active ingredient to treat uh, there are mosquito issues there. And you know, one thing with uh, this pest is that there is something called pest resistance. Some um, pests with time show resistance to some of these active ingredients that we use in the industry. So this particular active ingredient is actually Delta Matrin, all right? So a lot of the practitioners have been using Delta Matrin. Some use Lambda So Putting together all the reports and the certificate they gave us from that hotel, we decided that we were not going to use any of the active ingredients that those people had used. Just so that, you know, we will not be dealing with resistance. And you know what? That was what solved the problem for us and we were able to deal with the issue. So we used another um, active ingredient. We used the uh, uh, bifetrine. Yes, that was what we used, and we were able to control uh, the mosquitoes in that facility. All right, so going forward, when we talk about um, vector control, there's something called IVM. I'm sure a lot of us don't know about this. It's actually called Integrated Vector Management. It's related to IPM. As we, will go, as we go on, we will see the uh, similarities. So I'm expanding this so that we can see what it uh, looks like. But of course, most of what we'll be talking about will be practical 
uh, based, what I will want you to do is after this session, you will go back to the material and look at, at them. So from this diagram, you will see that um, we have uh, chemical control, we have uh, physical control, we have biological control, and we have prevent preventative practices, we have surveillance, we have public education. So all these come together to form what we call integrated vector management, all right? So we'll be moving fast and uh, practical solutions is what I'll be giving us so that the class can be meaningful uh, for us. Now, mosquito control is divided into two areas mainly, individual and public. So most often it is performed following the integrated mosquito management concept, which is called IMM. IMM is based on ecological, economic and social criteria and integrates multidisciplinary methodologies into pest management strategies that are practical and effective to protect public health and the environment and improve the quality of life. Now, if we flick back to the, the second slide, yeah, I wrote there that no mosquito control strategy is ever complete without proper larviciding procedure. No mosquito control strategy is ever complete without proper larviciding procedures. What do we mean by larviciding? Larviciding is actually a term used to describe somebody's mic is unmuted there. Okay, so larviciding is a term actually used to describe the effort we put into uh, into play to deal with mosquito larva, those larva that will grow up to come and be disturbing us, you know, deal with the pupa uh, at their growing stage before they become adults. So proper larviciding is important in every mosquito control procedure. Then every mosquito control battle is one primarily outdoors. What do I mean by that? Now, if you deal with mosquitoes indoors and you have not dealt with the ones outdoors, definitely you are fighting a lost battle because those ones outdoors will still come inside to deal with your client. All right, so we go back to the slide we were on. So IMM uh, strategies are employed in concert with insecticide. So this includes source reduction, which incorporates physical control, digging ditches and ponds in target areas and biology control as a placing live mosquito fish in the ditches and ponds to eat mosquito larva. All that non-chemical control methods include invertebrate predators, parasites, and diseases to control mosquito larva. So we don't do this in this part of the world, actually introducing parasites and all that. But what we can do is uh, bait for mosquitoes. Like um, there was a job we did uh, at a particular place in Naja. So mosquito has been eating them alive there and the place is like mushy. So what we did, because uh, of the kind of training I had, they, in my own training, they showed us all these kind of things. We dug trenches around that area. It's um, a mini estate, like a, an estate of um, five blocks, yeah, duplexes and all that. So mosquitoes have been disturbing them. What we did was to dig trenches around the place. So we made um, artificial uh, dwelling places for these mosquitoes. You know, mosquitoes love water, standard water. So we, did, we dug that trench, made the place comfortable for them. And what did we do with the trenches? Uh, we poured water in them. And in the, in the water, we, we poured um, something called IGRL. As we go on, we will get to know all these things. Um, instead growth regulator into the, into the pond, as it were. And what happened? All the mosquitoes, most of the mosquitoes in that vicinity were converging in that place. And because they were laying eggs there, the IGR was taking care of them and knocking them out. So, but because we have dealt with adult mosquitoes indoors, those ones outdoors couldn't reproduce fast enough to become adults to be biting them indoors. So I'm saying that to underscore what I just read that now that um, uh, where, where, where they said uh, this includes source reduction, 
that's reducing the mosquitoes at source. You know, where physical control, digging of ditches and ponds in target areas are employed. And then sometimes you put biological control. I don't know if some of us, when we were young, whether we remember that we used to fish in gutters, these stagnant gutters of Lagos, all right? You see those fishes in those gutters were actually introduced by the federal government at some point to deal with mosquito. One mosquito control program they did one time. So those fishes, what the fishes in those gutters were meant to be doing, I don't know whether any of us were, uh, uh, know what I'm talking about. Those days we used to fish, get catch all small, small fishes, color fishes, um, multicolored fishes. Those fishes were supposed to be eating the lava in the uh, gutters. So this is one of the ways uh, larviciden is done. Mosquito is controlled, introducing mosquito eating fishes. Uh, their, their name is actually Gambusia. That's what they call those fishes. So when you introduce those fishes, they eat up these uh, mosquitoes that are about to develop into adults. Okay, sometimes you introduce uh, biological controls like uh, um, birds, bats, and all that. Frogs, frogs to eat uh, mosquitoes. But like I said, in Nigeria, all these practices are not so uh, popular. Now, in the use of pesticides to deal with mosquitoes, how do we use pesticides? You know, a lot of people are used to agro um, chemicals. I'm going to show us in the class today how to actually use agrochemicals to deal with uh, mosquitoes. Now, before we started, uh, because getting IG out are actually difficult. Before now, it's been difficult. You have to import them from abroad to use them. So what we used to do in those gutters where we need to lave aside, yeah, we take our motorized um, sprayer those power spray, either the mist blower, the big mouth, or the other one with small, the pressure sprayers. Inside those gutters, we spray the gutters and make sure we agitate the water in the gutters. By the time you do that, they no burn the lava well to, 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 to develop into adult mosquito. So um, uh, products like, uh, uh, Delta Action, which is a uh, Delta Metrine, products like uh, Lambda Car, which is Lambda Cellotrine, and some of them in the market like that. Those are what we use to do our lab siding procedures, and they've been working wonderfully well. But the, the point is this, you have to agitate the water. So I'm saying this so that in case you, do, you, 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 you can't lay your hands on IGRs, in case you can lay your hands on um, you know, those insect growth regulators that we use for these gutters, you can do this and get a 100% kill ratio. But the waters in the gutter has to be agitated because if they are not agitated, you won't achieve results. Now, I'm sure a lot of us are used to uh, this system of pouring black oil in water. You know, some, some have been using that practice for a long time. They say when, they, when you pour black oil on top of water, it will make, uh, disturb the lava there. It will make them not to be able to uh, breathe or grow to become adult mosquitoes. All my life, when you pour black oil into gutter, at best, what you are doing is um, environmental, uh, what's it called now, <laughs> pollution. Yeah, because the way these lava then, the way they breathe underwater, there's something they have. I'm trying to remember the name. Um, they call that thing now, but before the end of the I, I, I will remember. So with that stuff in their mouth, they attach themselves to the surface of water. You know, that thing is like a pipe with which they breathe air from the surface of the water. And it, protu it protrudes a little bit out of the water, meaning that no matter the quantity of oil you pour on top of the gutter or inside the water in the gutter, it's not going to affect them at all. So stop pouring black oil in gutters, thinking that it will deter mosquitoes, thinking that it will um, kill mosquito lava in the water. It doesn't. Your best bet is to use your, um, your mist blower, use your power sprayer, you know, mix your insecticide in it, 
spray in the gutters, make sure the water in the gutter is agitated. You have destroyed uh, the lava. Those are the practical ways we deal with uh, mosquitoes and it's been giving us 100% um, results. An efficient way to control mosquitoes is to find and eliminate their larval habitat where the larva are produced. If you find them, you destroy their habitat, you are good. So eliminating large larva development sites, which is called source reduction, such as swamps or gutters as you, as you have in Lagos, or sluggishly moving streams or ditches may require sometimes community-wide efforts, especially for those gutters that are very, very big and canal. You know, this is actually sometimes usually um, a task for the government and all that. But the one we can do, the gutter surrounding the area we are treating, we have control over those gutters. And if we do these things, as I have listed, as I have uh, talked about them, we are good to go. So talking about larviciding, um, the best uh, insecticides to use for mosquito control even for this lab we are talking about, are pretroids. Actually, they are the best. Pretroids. Pretroids are the best. So if you uh, don't know what pretroids are, I'm, I think you should go back and uh, get more info. But pretroids, in the family of pretroids, we have um, lambda cyalotrin, we have dertametrin, we have parmetrin, we have sapametrin, and um, defentrin. You know, all those chemicals that, that have their names ending in train, 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 they all belong to the family of uh, pretroids, you know. So they are very, very good for mosquito control. Now, but to achieve the best result and the best safe result for lava control, IGRs are still the best bet. Insect growth regulators, what these uh, products do is, um, they actually stop the development of lava and make those lava, make it difficult for them to grow into adults, adults that will be disturbing your clients and, and all that. If you can lay your hands on IGL, they are perfect. Now, the beautiful thing about uh, the times we are in now is that um, there is a particular IGL that is available in the market at Top Knock. I'm going to share uh, the picture with, uh, the fortune so that he can post it on, our, on the forum for the trainee so that you can have access to, to some of these things. IGRs work wonderfully for lava um, control. Now, there are some steps that as a practitioner you should take when you are doing mosquito control. So your job is not just to go into the um, apartment, spray the place and get out. When you do that, you've not done anything. What you have succeeded at best to do is maybe you kill a few uh, adult mosquitoes indoors, but you've not taken care of the ones outdoors that will come inside after you are gone to disturb your clients. So one of the steps is to destroy and dispose of tin cans, you know, cans around the place you are treating, old tires, anything that can retain water, that can retain water that, that, that will attract uh, mosquitoes to, to come and be laying eggs in them you know, dispose of them, unused plastic swimming pools, you know, plastic swimming pools in the compound, remove them or overturn them. You know, any container that collect or hold water, get rid of them. Then sometimes mosquitoes hide inside um, debris, you know, any debris inside gutter around the place you are treating. If you can't get rid of them, ask your clients to get rid of them prior to your uh, visit. It will help a great deal because if you don't do all these things, those are the places the mosquitoes will go to hide and come out from after you are done. So standing water under uh, or around structures, remove them. You know, then for some buildings that have flat roof, you know, those decking roofs, sometimes they, they have pool of water on top of those roofs, and from there mosquitoes come and um, breed. So these are the things you need to do to ensure um, a good mosquito control outing. So even faucets, air conditioner units that leak water and all that, wherever water drops, you know, are potential breeding grounds for mosquitoes. As long as that water is just a few inches deep. When I say inches, I mean like half an inch or one inch. Mosquito can go there to lay eggs. Okay. 
So you drain puddles, ditches in swampy areas. Then some trees around where you're treating, you know, sometimes trees have holes in them. Mosquitoes can go into these holes, especially when they are filled with water and they lay their eggs there, you won't know. So these are the things you watch out for in your mosquito treatment regime. Watch out for areas where water is gathered, where water um, mosquitoes can actually go to lay their eggs because you don't want mosquitoes laying eggs because when they do, within two weeks, within two weeks, I tell you, like 14 days, yeah, the uh, mosquito larvas will develop into adults and will begin to wreak havoc on your plants. So seepages from cisterns, septic tanks, make sure they are eliminated. You know, check for trapped water in plastic or canvas tarpaulins. You know, those tarpaulins that they use to cover things. Even uh, those things that you use to cover um, cars, sometimes they collect water. You won't know. So that's why inspection is really, really important. So those things collect water. You won't know. You go do your treatment, but there are uh, mosquitoes trapped in, in those uh, places, lava and all that. Okay, and when it comes to lawns and um, uh, gardens, if they are not properly irrigated, water will gather in them. You know, there are houses that have lawns, green lawns, people keep lawns. If those lawns have small, small ditches in them, mosquitoes will, you know, lay eggs in them and will breed there. So you make sure you look out for those things and uh, deal with them. Um, if it's a spray, you spray. If it's to get rid of the water, um, you, you do that. Now, but there's another method that is, has been introduced in recent times now. Uh, it is called the lava sonic. I don't, <laughs> we don't have it in Nigeria at the moment, all right? What this does is that it, um, it transmits sound energy into a body of water at a particular frequency. And what this energy does is that it goes into the, the air bladders of the mosquitoes and ruptures their air bladder and then the internal tissue and cause death for mosquito lovers. We don't have, I've not seen them. It's just been described. Uh, it was described to me at a training I attended. I've not seen them in Nigeria yet. But the one you can do, you do. I've given you a simple process. If you don't have idea, you can use your normal um, agro insecticides to do larviciding and you will do it effectively. Now, when you talk of adult mosquito control, there are different ways to do that. There's one we call the mosquito traps. You can use mosquito traps, though in this part of the world, we don't really have them. So there are numerous devices that are available for purchase that claim to attract, repel, or kill outdoor infestations of mosquitoes. But mind you, you should thoroughly research before you buy anyone for your client, because some of them, a lot of them don't work. Some traps are designed to mimic potential mammalian hosts by emitting a plume of carbon dioxide. These ones are, very, are actually effective. Yeah, so they mimic um, a plume of carbon dioxide, because what actually attracts mosquitoes to human beings is actually the carbon dioxide that we produce. As you sleep and snore, you produce, you emit carbon dioxide, you breathe in oxygen. The carbon dioxide you are breathing out attracts mosquitoes. That is what attracts them, all right? So this product um, emits carbon dioxide and that by attracting mosquitoes, Okay, so these things are, uh, sometimes you have additional attractants in them, like uh, what we call octanol. So this attractant attract the mosquitoes into that device. And after drawing the insect into the trap, into the trap, a vacuum device sucks the mosquito into a net or cylinder where they dehydrate and dry. You know, so there's no zapping or anything, no pesticides used in that kind of process. But the fact is this, Scientific data relative to the effectiveness of these devices is sparse. You know, so be sure to review all information available before using any one of these products. I can't, nobody can vouch for them. 
Now, there's something we call space spraying. You know, we have different ways to do spraying. Most of us, when we buy our sprayers, we think that our sprayers can actually do everything. You know, some of these sprayers come with different nozzles. They come with different um, uh, nozzles. I'm sure you know what I mean. There's this uh, tip, nozzle tips, you know, that are different types. There's the fan shape, there's the cone, cone nozzle and all that. So space spraying, what does it do? So the advantage of space spraying treatment is immediate knockdown, quick application, and relative small amount of material is required for the treatment. So what do you do in space spraying? It's actually spraying into the air. Because there's no way you want to deal with mosquito that you will not spray into the air. But the fact is this, it is only when you are treating for mosquitoes that you should spray into the air. If you are dealing with crawling insects, you don't have any business spraying into the air. Because crawling insects, what they need, what you need to do is drop um, uh, your solution for them so that they can crawl over them and have contact with them and they affect them. But as long as it's mosquito you are dealing with, space treatment, space spraying is important. And this space spraying we are talking about, your normal sprayer cannot deliver it. Your normal sprayer cannot deliver because the solution that is coming out needs to be aer aer aerosolized. It means that the um, microns need to be very, very small, such that when you spray them into the air, they remain in the air to affect the mosquitoes in that particular space. Because if they can't stay in the air, if your spray cannot remain in the air for some time, it won't have any effect. You understand? So what it then means is that the best um, equipment to use for space spraying is actually your ULV. Your ULV. ULV is perfect for mosquito control. Yes, um, these compression sprayers are also very, very good because uh, the, the microns that comes out of them are actually you know, good enough to deal with um, space spraying. But you can't space spray with your jack tool. You cannot do space spraying with your normal knapsack sprayer. It's not possible. You cannot do normal space spraying with your um, with your power sprayer at all. So to, for you to um, get a hundred percent effectiveness in your mosquito control, a ULV is very very important. So if you don't have a ULV, you're going for a mosquito control job. Make sure you rent one. Seriously, if you want to get the job done. ULV is very good. Compression sprayer is also very, very good. But the thing is this, as professionals, it is only insecticides that are labeled for flying insects that should be sprayed into the air, all right? And it is only insecticides that have fumigant properties that you should spray into the air. What do I mean by fumigant properties? You know, fumigant properties are like, um, uh, that has to do with uh, uh, respiration of the pest you are dealing with. You know, something that will be in the air that someone can take in through the nostril or can breathe in. You know, those are fumigant uh, properties. You know, so it's important that you also know the mode of entry of um, chemicals. That's one of one of them I've told you so. Uh, fumigant. There's contact poison. There's a stomach poison. So in the case of mosquito control. The best forms of chemicals to use are most, uh, chemicals that will affect, um, that, that, that act as fumigants. Retroids are very good at this, right? So that's that for space spraying. There's something called indoor residual spraying in mosquito control. Indoor residual spraying. I'm sure a lot of us are um, used to this terminology. But the fact is this, yeah? What indoor res residual spraying does is, as the name implies, it involves coating the walls of a particular space and surfaces of the house with residual insecticide. When we say residual insecticide, we are talking about insecticide that when you spray them on a particular surface, they stay on that surface for a long time. And that length of time they are there, they will keep on knocking the insects, any insect that come in contact with them where they are sprayed on, 
they keep on dying for a space for a space of say three months. Some even last for six months, depending on the product. So examples of residual insecticides are your um, uh, saponate is one of them. Tempo is one of them, and there are some of them in the market. But the fact is that residual insecticides are very, very, very expensive. But these are the kinds of insecticides that you do your indoor residual spraying with. And indoor residual spraying is best done with a compression sprayer. You know, those sprayers that you pump, those cylindrical shiny ones, most, most of them are shiny. Those are the best for space spraying. And when you're doing your space spraying, there's a method to it. There's a method to it. That's not our topic for today. But maybe I can do an addendum and then add to this uh, slide so that the fortune can share with, with you. So the normal, the way to do it is you spray a particular section of the wall from from the from the roof uh, from the ceiling top down to the floor, um, section by section. You make sure that all the surfaces of the wall in that room is you know coated. And as you are spraying, your spraying should be done in such a way that. Um, as you're spraying, uh, the, there's something called, what's the name now? But what I'm trying to say is that as you're spraying on the wall, watch out for what you're spraying to a point of dripping. If your spraying does not get to that point where it's, it's dripping a little from, from the wall, it will not be effective. So it has to get to that um, dripping stage for it to be effective. Okay, I hope I'm still audible. Am I making sense? Anybody? Please just unmute your mind. I need to know whether I'm making sense a little. You're making a lot of fire, sense. Fire, fire. Yes, sir. Yes, you're making sense. You're yeah, making sense, sense, sir. Okay, yes, so let's, yes, sir. Let's move to ourselves now so that I can go on. Yeah, of course, sir. Thank you. Mute Thank yourself you. so that I can go on. No. All right, just a moment. Uh, by the way, the picture you are seeing there at the front cover of the um, of the slide is my family. You know, that's a picture showing a healthy family that is pest free, where there's no pest in our house. That's why I use the uh, picture there. So, but the aim of vector control is to be able uh, uh, to, to be able to read an environment of um, mosquitoes, of disease causing mosquitoes, sickness causing mosquitoes, so that your client will have um, a mosquito free environment and they will live a healthy, a healthy life. So we're talking about IRS now, but there's a problem with IRS. I wouldn't even advise anybody to do IRS. IRS is very expensive, very, very expensive. The chemical you use for IRS, expensive. The equipment you use for IRS is expensive. And then the, it is strenuous, it is a big job. It's, I mean, the last IRS I did, by the time we finished the job, see, our, we couldn't lift up our right hand because it was a very, very tiring job. Nowadays, I don't even do IRS. We don't do IRS again. Because the fact is this, if you manage or if you are successful in dealing with mosquitoes around you, you don't need to do IRS inside. There's no need doing IRS inside if you have gotten rid of the lava outside and you have gotten rid of the mosquitoes lying around outside. Then what you now need to do is what we call uh, um, the cultural control. When we get there, we'll talk about it. But your client, you need to make your, understand, uh, your client understand that um, the mosquito screening, the nets should be in place, the screen doors should be in place. And in your inspection, you inspect whether, you inspect, check the integrity of this screening to make sure that there's no hole in them that mosquitoes can come in through, all right? You know, the essence of this thing, the inspection you do is this. And after your inspection, write a report sent to your client 
let your client know what the what he needs to do what she needs to do and let your client know what you are doing the reason is this for mosquito mosquito control is a very tricky business you could finish a, a treatment now the next day they call you ah mosquito oh in jewa abi how they say in yoga that mosquito if they jewa pambi you you share the shilano ah read here you know that kind of thing so to protect yourself you send for you send ahead of you your report in your report the um responsibility of your client should be stated there okay if your client is supposed to fix net you should fix them your recommendation is that those should be fixed um uh, next should be changed um, um next should be installed then you put there a clause if these things are not done your treatment regime will be um will be jeopardized so if you do that you have left a, an escape loop for yourself it's very important because mosquito treatment is very tricky especially in this part of the world but you can get it right and like i said in the in the other slide that i i, I put there let me quickly go back there so that, that we acquaint ourselves with that with that um, quote i said the mosquito control battle is a battle is one primarily outdoors it is outdoors that you win the fight against mosquitoes you can do um Yes, you do a lot indoors, but outdoors, if you don't take care of your outdoors, forget it. What you did indoors is rubbish. All right? Time is seriously flying, and I'm still in mosquito control. But I'm going to share this slide so that we, we move quickly into, um, into um, IPM. But what I want to say in closing on mosquito control is this. You see, don't let anybody, <laughs> let anybody. Hello. Don't yep. let anybody deceive. 11:44 a.m. No solutions for spoken more. Don't let anybody deceive Thanks. you. You can use agrochemicals to deal with to do your mosquito control. You can use agrochemicals, like I've shared with you, how you can use it to do your lavisiding in the gutter. Yeah, you can use them indoors too. But you need to know how you need to know mixing ratio you know all this uh that's why training is actually good maybe in the next training whatever we do we are going to be talking about mixing proportions we are going to be talking about um, calibration and all that these are what we need to know as practitioners so that whenever you go out there you are going out with the confidence that you can deliver on any job okay so mosquito treatment your lavisiding is key if you don't get it right forget it and anywhere where there is a swimming pool in the area you are treating, if that swimming pool doesn't have, you know, normally swimming pools have this something that agitates them inside. If your the swimming pool is not agitated, is a risk factor. Mosquitoes will lay eggs in them. We have done a job for a particular hotel. That hotel has a swimming pool, and that swimming pool is not agitated. Mosquitoes were laying eggs, and there were lava inside the pool. All right, so these are things you need to um, um, watch out for. Please meet yourself. Somebody is muted. Pro, can you unmute yourself? I muted everybody. Okay, I'm audible now, right? Good.
Yes, you all did. We can hear you perfectly. Beautiful. All right. So I was talking about uh, vegetation. Um, when you are doing your mosquito treatment, vegetation is important to look out for vegetation. You need to do your vegetation management. So I was saying that um, adult mosquitoes prefer to rest on weeds and other vegetation. So it means that if there are flowers in the area you are treating, there are hotels, like I, like I always talk about hotels because um, we service a lot of hotels and we do mosquito treat control for them. Now, there are some facilities that have life plants in them. We have had to, we have had to advise some of them to change to artificial plants. Why? So that our job will be made easier. So that our job will be made easier because uh, mosquitoes like vegetation, they hide in them, all right? And the fact is this, the more you spray on vegetation, the, the higher the risk of killing uh, ornamentals in the, in, in, the, in the particular place you are, you are treating. All right, so, so as not to uh, put yourself in that scenario, in that situation, advise your client. We've done it, we've succeeded on many occasions, change the life plan to artificial plant, and it has worked well for us. But if you have vegetation in the place you are treating, use your mist blower. Misting is perfect for this kind of situation, outside control, misting is perfect. Um, the reason is that for this outside control, uh, uh, vegetation control, you need a, uh, your, the microns that you're supposed to be delivering, you know, in your spraying should be a little bit more coarse than that of the ULV. ULV is finer, but for mist blower, it's a little bit heavier. So you need that and all that. Sometimes uh, people use fogging too to take care of the outside, but I don't, I don't fog. I don't fog and I have my reason. Some, some people use thermal foggers. Thermal foggers work fine too, but I consider the next compound to the place I'm treating. If I'm using a thermal fogger, the smoke can travel to other places and get into their residence. So I don't use thermal fogger. I use a mist blower. Uh, that motorized sprayer, um, the one with the big mouth, that's the one we use for the outside for vegetation and all that. Okay, so moving on. I think we can jump into integrated pest management now. All right, so integrated pest management, uh, the way, the only way I describe integrated pest management is this. I say it is the only professional way to do pest control. If you are not doing integrated pest management, Believe me, you are not doing a professional job as a person. As my opinion is debatable, but that's that's what I practice. So if you don't practice IPM, um, I will say you are not practicing professional pest control because with IPM, a lot goes into IPM. So not all pest control problems are tackled the same way. Professionals with years of pest control experience have outlined various methods and techniques that are best for controlling certain insects and rodents. It all starts with practicing integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is a term used to describe an approach to pest control that focuses on preventing pest control problems and making it so that chemicals are not the first plan of action to get rid of pests, but rather is viewed as a last resort. This means that you perform a detailed examination of conducive conditions around the place you are treating, you make environmental modifications as, as it were, and take other steps to make sure that the pest infestation doesn't develop. You know, this is a technique that professionals apply to reduce the need for applying chemicals and helping the environment so a chemical treatment doesn't occur unless they absolutely have to in order to address the problem. So I'm just going to summarize this. You will get the material, you can go through it. I said that IPM is the only professional way to do pest control. If you look at this diagram that I've expanded here, this is like components of, uh, there are so many paradigms of IPM actually, many of them. IPM is a huge, I studied, a, <laughs> in fact, I studied IPM as a course for six months. IPM, only IPM. So it's a very huge uh, topic, but we're just going to like summarize it a little. Look at this diagram here. You see pest identification, you see prevention, you see monitoring, you see 
choose options, action, evaluation. These are components of IPM. There are so many others, but this is like um, a compression of, of them. When you go through the notes, you, you see them, all right? So there are some definitions of IPM actually. Some have defined IPM as uh, the practice of preventing or suppressing damaging population of insect pests by application of the comprehensive and coordinated integration of multiple control tactics. Some have described IPM uh, that it combines the use of biological, cultural, and chemical practices to control insect pests. It seeks to use natural predators or parasites to control pests using selective pesticides for backup only when pests are unable to be controlled by natural means. Some people have described RPM to be an approach that depends greatly on knowledge of pest biology and ecology to allow tactical decision making by PMPs in order to optimize the control of pest organisms. See, that's why I mentioned the fact that it is the only professional way to deal with, to do pest control. Because without a great knowledge of pest biology, how do you intend to deal with the pest you want to treat? And this IPM embrace, embraces all these things. The IPM is an ecosystem approach to the control of pests that combines different management strategies and practices and minimize the use of pesticides. So IPM therefore utilizes the best mix of control tactics for a given pest problem. That's still talking about IPM. Now, some people think, uh, think that IPM is a system or a method where, um, where chemicals are not used at all, but it's not true. It's actually a mix of every, every kind of practice you can think of. But the fact is that chemicals are used as a last resort, not the first. So it means that you get into a facility, you want to treat the facility. There are so many things you consider before you consider application of pesticides. That means you consider the fact that you need to do exclusion. You consider the fact that some mechanical factors need to be in place. You consider the fact that uh, the habitat of this pest needs to be dealt with and all that before you go into um, pesticide, the usage of uh, pesticide. See, typically the main aim of IPM program is on agricultural insect pests. That was how why, where IPM started from. So although originally developed for agricultural pest management, IPM programs are now developed to encompass diseases, weeds, and other pests that may interfere with the management objective of sites such as residential and commercial structures, lawn and turf areas, and home and community gardens. So IPM use current comprehensive information on the life cycles of pests and their interaction with the environment. This information in combination with available pest control methods is used to manage pest damage by the most economical means and with the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment. So that's just the fact. So any um, treatment approach you you want to embark on that doesn't take into consideration the health of people, the health of your client. I mean, it's, um, it's not professional. So that's why I said IPM is the only professional way to do pest control. And if you don't know it, it's good you know it. The fortune mentioned the fact that um, they are going to clamp down on quacks. I tell you the fact that there are professional quacks. Professional quacks are people that are certified, but really don't know the job, all right? So that's why this training is, 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 is really, really important. Trainings upon training, because by the time they are weeding out the quacks, it won't be nice to weed out professionals too as they are weeding out quacks, all right? So just that's by the way, anyway. So when we talk about uh, the paradigm that I showed us here, I've listed definitions of um, all of them here in the, in the notes. Okay, so we have pest identification, we have prevention, monitoring. So pest identification is um, um, the crucial, the first crucial step in solving the problem. Okay, whether your pest is a weed, insect, or animal, or microbe, all the organism, correct identification, identification can determine if the organism is harmful, if it is beneficial, if it is benign. Benign means that it is there, but is not, uh, it's not really harmful. 
it's visible, but it's not harmful. So there's no point dealing with it, okay? So misidentification of pests is a common cause of pest control failures. Remember, I told us about the fact that we are supposed to see ourselves as doctors, as pharmacists, as surgeons. Imagine a doctor misdiagnosing a particular ailment and mistreating. What happens? You know, possible loss of life, all right? So misidentification of pests is a common cause of pest control failure. So correct pest identification can make management more effective, often saving time and money. There have been occasions where you just enter a building, you want to deal with um, rodents, and you find that just blocking the entry uh, points where they enter the apartment from solves the problem. So you have saved yourself money, you have saved yourself stress, and the client is paying you big for it. So prevention is the next line, is the next one in that paradigm. You know, the way, what we say in Nigeria, our parlance, common parlance, say prevention is better than cure. So prevention is often the most effective method of dealing with pests. Eliminating ideal conditions for the pests, when you do that, you have done 90% of, of the job. So preventive measures can be incorporated even into a building design before the building comes up. Yeah? into a farm plan, uh, when you talk about agriculture, as you are building your house, if you consider prevention of pests, it will go a long way in preventing pests eventually. So maintaining a clean and healthy environment also helps. Those are prevention uh, methods. Monitoring, that's the next thing uh, there after prevention. So monitoring is paying close attention to the area you want to treat. Knowing the state of the system helps prevent smaller issues from becoming larger expenses in time and money. So when you are monitoring, you're monitoring identify factors that contribute to the pest problem, such as poor sanitation, decline in beneficial organism, you know, and then consistent monitoring is part of evaluating efficacy, you know, monitoring. So the next one there is, um, uh, choosing options, okay? Integrated pest management includes uh, timely decision-making that can prevent and control pests. The particular situation will narrow the choices from the generally wide range of methods and options. You know, understanding the life cycle of whatever pests you're treating, you know, when you understand their life cycle and uh, what the pest needs to thrive, when you know all that, it provides you with a clue as to the most efficient way to deal with the problem and manage it. So the options can actually range from sanitation to conserving natural enemies, even to chemical intervention. So that is the uh, IPM paradigm there. Um, I will implore us, because my time is fast spent, to go and uh, look at this material. I'm going to put it up. But if um, you haven't learned anything from my delivery um, this morning. I want you to go with the fact that your job as a pest management professional is a very critical one. See yourself as a physician, see yourself as a pharmacist. You dare not misdiagnose, you dare not mispres misprescribe, you dare not mistreat. So because you, you shouldn't do all that, you should take IPM as seriously as you can. That is my message for us today. Thank you very much. I hope uh, it was useful. The fortune, over to you. Uh, bro, 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 bro. Thank you so much. What is the session we have there? What is the session we have? Can everybody just unmute? Open your, open your video. Let us just say, let's just give, let's give some props on the, uh, no. No. Can we just that. see you that you can really follow in the class? Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, you really follow oh, it. Thank you. 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 Thank so now we are going to go to question and answer quickly because we still have, we still have two more classes this morning. 
Mm -hmm. But I'm going to go to question and answer, and, uh, and I can see everybody is very serious with this course, and that's the way it should be. You know, we need to take knowledge. Some of us say, but I know all this thing before, but there are certain punchlines that they are brought in now that you like, I never like, like so you can't really say you know it all. Knowledge is very key and very essential in everything you do. Now I'm going to meet, I'm going to meet everybody again, I'm going to, and uh, then I'm going to ask a question, question, three persons to ask questions before we allow props to go for this. So question, Kyle, they allow me to again. You want to ask a question? Can we ask have a question, Kyle? They yeah. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Professor. It was a very beautiful class. I gained a lot from it. So I have a, a few questions, but I'm just going to ask one because of time so other people can also ask. Um, the question I'm asking is about um, dealing with the lava, dealing okay. with the, dealing with the lava um, mosquitoes before they get to the adults. Yeah. So you made mention of um, of doing some certain strategies to deal with them. Yes. And um, what I could bring from it was, it was more of, it was more about um, a large, a big project. That is maybe when you go to your hotels that they want to fumigate or do pest control, you tell them what to do and what not to do and how to kill the lava or disinfect the place. But it wasn't really about those that get jobs per, let's say, maybe for just a residential apartment or maybe just one house is planning to fumigate his place out of 20 houses in the streets. So how do we do that? How do we do the laviciding, like the gutters of the person's place? After doing, after doing the person's space or the person's gutter, you know, subsequently, other people's other people's gutter would still the lava would still breed in their gutters or in yeah. um, stagnant waters. So, mm -hmm. how do we avoid those from from going to the space that we are actually working on? That's okay. just my question. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, see here. Uh, when you are dealing with residents, uh, you have to take on the fact that. It is an unfortunate fact that you need to do laviciding for areas that are even beyond, you know, where the person is staying. So what I mean is this: if it's a block of four flats and you are dealing with just one flat there, you see the gutter in front of that house. Eh? Even though the person did not pay you uh, that much to treat the gutters, you have to do it because that is the strength of your treatment. What you do outside is the strength of whatever happens inside. So because you know that that is the strength of your treatment, you will know, you know that you need to deal with it. So what we do, what we do is this. Um, you know, the boundary, you know, every house will have a boundary where uh, on both sides, the right side, uh, left side. I go beyond like um, 10 meters, to the right, 10 meters to the left, I do the gutters. And that way, I take care of the, of the issue. After dealing with the outside though, after dealing with the inside, sorry, I come outside, I do the gutters, I do 10 meters to the left, 10 meters to the, to the right. That's what I do. And it works, it works for me. I don't know if that makes sense, if it, um, Okay, yeah, it's, it actually makes sense. It makes sense. So I'm, I'm looking at it from the point of, I'm not even looking at it from the point of maybe block of apartments. I'm looking at it from the perspective of people on the streets. So let's say there's just a single house on that street. I mean, there is a single house that you got the job for and they have about, let's say, 10 houses or five houses on either sides of the streets and they have a blocked gutter that is automatically a breeding site for the lavas so if are we to just do the front gutter of the resident that we got the job from or we persuade other members of the streets to also do their pest management which we know some people would not do 
And uh, see, you don't persuade, you don't have control over somebody that is not your client. So you don't persuade anybody. I just told you that you go 10 meters to the right, 10 meters. So if that 10 meters falls into other people's apartment, you do it. That, their gutter, you do it. Nobody will squeeze their face when they are seeing you treating their gutter. They would like you to do it. So, I mean, that's the responsibility I take on when I take on residential apartments. And when I, go so. for my, when I go for my inspection, uh, if the gutters are, are sealed, it then means that I have to use thermal fogger, you know, you know, to take care of the mosquitoes inside, inside the sealed gutters and, and, and everything. So, but treat the gutters, you must. It's important. If you don't do that, I mean, it will render the job you've done inside um, very, very uh, less effective. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Still waiting for questions. Okay. The next question now. Can I call on Muidin? Muidin? Can you ask the question? Is Muidin there? Let's take the next question. Like, if Moody is not there, go to Sam Lukman. Can we get your question quickly? The next Salman. Okay, me didn't send the text that is good there. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, Salman, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Let's ask. The next one is. Well, Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get you. I said, I mean, the lecture was well done, but I really enjoyed it. But to get to that, everything is quite fast. Now, my question, sir. In a situation whereby we have a very large, I mean, let me, okay, let me just call it an estate, whereby you know, buildings are being built together. And we have an uh, we have an occupant of the building who said, okay, come on, this is for me, come on, do first control for me, first control for me. And the other one said, see, I don't want the I don't want the smell, I don't want this. Oh, so how do you keep one on hand that one in a way that whatever we do here will not have an effect on the other on the other uh other occupants of the of the other house. Okay. Uh, the, the thing is this: uh, um, wh when it comes to, are you talking about mosquito control now or generally? Yeah. Hello. Are you talking Hello. about mosquito control now or general? Hello, I, I think this, sir. Are you referring to uh, mosquito control or general pest control? Hello, yes, I'm talking about mosquito control. Uh, in the treatment of mosquitoes, eh, um, the fact is that the chemicals or the active ingredients for mosquito control are actually the type that we took when people perceive it. Is there, there are chemicals that will disturb people. So the thing to do is, um, if the neighbors are complaining, let your... Uh, uh, clients, no. Yeah. We have, we've had occasions where clients speak to the neighbors. They are, ah, this is what I want to do, and uh, you know that kind of thing. So they have to be in agreement before you do what you have to do. You can't just go and uh, begin to spew out uh, treatment, especially for mosquito control. Oh, mosquito control, you use uh, uh, the chemicals you use for mosquito control. Most times, some of a lot of them choke because a lot of them have uh, familiar properties. And um, you don't want to um, have a situation where people are breathing in all these things, you know. So, so can I get a test like uh, termites and rodents? Uh, can I ask a question? That? But that's not the. That's okay, not you the, just ask the question. That's the point of the discussion. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I have I have a client who asked me to come and to come and uh, treat termite. I mean, it's just like uh, it's, a, it's a it's a landscape area, and which have 
tried it over and over and the termite is not going. Then I understand that I understand the termite was, termite was imported through the soil that was being spread on the I mean on the farm. I don't know which best way can I take to I mean to and as for the rodent. Rodent to has the same, uh, almost same thing, which uh, is, is an high rise building. The first and third, uh, I mean, the, the rodent so, Okay, but let me just go straight and answer the time. I'll give you the question and answer the one for the rats. Hello? Yeah, hang on, let me, let me take the one for the uh, termites. Are you there? To answer your question, I will ask you a question. What, what did you use for your treatment? We tried. Okay, can me? Hello? I can barely hear you. What did you use for your termite treatment? Wow. I think we should just take the next question. Okay. Um, I think we should just go to the next question. Dami Tade, can we ask, I want to get your question. I know a lot of people want to ask questions and we are running beyond the real a few minutes to call it. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks for the very, very in-depth. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, I don't know, maybe you have tried this mosquitoes or granules. Am I with you? Are you Hello, okay. can you hear me, sir? Okay. Let me mute everybody. Let me mute everybody there. You mute yourself, please. So damn it, you can now unmute and uh and ask Okay. The okay. Good afternoon, sir. Please, I want oh. to ask about mosquito granules okay. uh, for outdoor. Um, does it really work? I don't know if you have tried it. Does it really work in Nigeria? I don't even That's know what you're question. talking about. Are they IGLs? Okay, so the, uh, no, they're not IGLs. It's actually for control. So, um, okay. Okay, so they are granules, just like, um, you know, you can, uh, they are granules that can be used outside. How do active ingredient? Um, I need to check now. I don't have that with me. I just wanted, I wanted to know because I know you're a prof when it comes to that. Okay, maybe I'll check then. I'll be able to send that to you. Okay. Then another question I wanted to ask because we were saying something about thermal foggers. Yes. Okay, so now the thermal fogger, um, same year, I'm also, also very, very careful when using thermal foggers, surely for even for uh, estates, uh, residential areas. You don't want to disturb your the, the other clients, as in the other neighbors around. But the challenge is this: there are sometimes that uh, maybe you get to a particular place, uh, maybe they've not used the house for for a long period of time. Especially during the summer period, people are coming back home. So yeah. I noticed because they are coming back home, um, I have a particular client that the house has not been used for. They only use the house maybe like twice a year. So the place is always is is, is extremely very. Uh, the sanitation is zero, and of okay. course there are several things hiding. So they have tires, they have cars parked inside the compounds, like almost fifteen cars parked. Nobody's using it, you know. And they have like tires. They have different things. So, but you know, if I'm going to use the motorized one, um, do you think that would be so effective than if I'm using a thermal for garden? Of course, the outdoor, I mean, the drainages. The drainages also they have that kind of challenge because the house the, the front of the house um, is actually grassy. Um, the drainage is zero. Fine, uh, we're claiming the drainages, but you know you are saying something like using a uh, thermal fogger. That most times when you're looking at the mosquito because they were after mosquitoes, they don't stay yeah. in Nigeria. So I'm looking at it that uh, of course if you're doing anything like mosquito control program for that particular home. Um, if I'm going to use a timer for that, do you think that's better or I need to use a motorized? Yeah, thank you. First of all, you need to understand that timer fogger, what it does is just knock down. Okay, so if you are using a timer for that, what you are looking at is maybe if maybe a few of the flying uh, mosquitoes around, you are knocking them down, you're, you're killing them. Yeah. You can't use timer for that to, to lavicide. 
you can it's not possible all right it's not possible so that limits the use of um karma for guys you know so for me i'm talking about my own i mean it's debatable i, I wouldn't take that machine i call it machine gun i wouldn't take that machine gun to a battle where i will use my normal mist blower my mist blower can take care of a lot of stuff okay so and it depends yeah, it depends on uh, the water you are treating. like you mentioned tires things that uh, capture water yeah. if you don't deal with all that and you pour your smoke you won't achieve anything at all you know so, so, so can i use both can i use both yes you can okay you can if the um situation permits you if uh, you're not going to be invading on other people's privacy with your smoke i mean but Really, uh, the 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 um, the success rates I've had with mosquito control, I don't use thermal forest. I use them. Um, what about for the the drainage then? For the drainage. Yeah, even for the drainage, yeah, your thermal fogger will only kill the flying mosquitoes inside the drainages. I get what I'm saying. Yes, for the I lava, agree. lava in in the water, you cannot take care of them. Yeah, but if I use IGL. Yeah, if you have IGL, yeah, drop in the water. Good. Yeah, you can. Without, without work. If I'm using the term, I forgot I use IGL. Without work. Yes, you can. Yeah, it will work. All right. What about the normal sprayer? Which one is normal sprayer? Napsack. Maybe the back, backpack one. See, that knapsack cannot do much for you. Can't do uh, much. Yes, <laughs> because the like I said, you need pressure. If you want to do blaviciding the way I, I taught you in the class, yeah? You need pressure to agitate the water in the gutter. So your napster can't do that. It's not possible. It's not. If you don't have water in the, in the drain, it won't happen. Oh, sir. Oh, I mean, if you don't have water, oh, water your tamar your fogger will do the job, man, sure. All right, okay. Fantastic. Thanks, Prof. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that was a robust interaction session. A lot of people want to ask Prof questions, right? Prof? <laughs> yeah. So let me I just see, take one more question. I see Mrs. Obiora waving. Thank you. Welcome, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, I'm going to take just one more person. I'm going to take Obiora. You already mentioned Obiora Precious. He's taking the next course anyway, so let us give her the privilege to have this question. Mrs. Yes. Obiora, sanitarian Precious Obiora. She should You're unmute welcome. herself. You are muted. Can you unmute yourself yes. and uh, ask a question so that we can now move straight to your Hello, class. good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, good can you friend. hear me? Yes. Very well. Yeah, bro. How are you doing now? I'm very fine. Well done, ma. Wow. Well done. Thank you. And uh, my honorable order. I ordered I agree to. <laughs> Yeah, so what well, actually, uh, mine is not a question, though. I want to contribute based okay. on the question that the lady asked. Yes. Yes, yeah, concerning the uh, using of water and uh, the mist blower. You know, there's this conception that a lot of us used to have. That, um, I hope you can hear me. Santiago, can you unmute yourself? I have to meet everybody to avoid the noise. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, Go clear. On. Okay, so quickly, I said that I just want to contribute to the response that Prof gave. You know, there's this misconception that a lot of us used to have um, concerning the use of um, um, thermal fogger, especially for outdoor spaces. You know, they believe that when you use the fogger, you've done, you know, the, the, the very best. But I want to tell you that if actually you want to have the best results that you desire, mist blowing or spraying still remains the best. Yes, sir. I still, I still, I, I, I still um, maintain to be corrected, but I think and I know that it still remains the best. You know what? When you fog, the fog is converted to gas, okay? Mm -hmm. And the air will just carry it off. You know, if you notice that when you're fogging, you know, because it's a vitiated air, it goes up. It doesn't come down. So what oh. it does is that it goes to the air, 
whatever insect that is flying or whatever, it will bring them down and knock them down, just like what Prof said. And that's what fogging does. So if you want to have a quick knockdown effect, you can use the fog, depending that the environment is suitable for that. I always emphasize that. That when you're using any uh, pesticide application equipment, make sure that the environment you're going to use it is suitable for that equipment. Okay? Yes, now, if you want to have a lasting effect, as far as that outdoor is concerned, you must use your mist blower or your knapsack because it will release that mix or the spray to the environment and it, it, the environment will absorb it and it retains it there for a while. Even if it's a drainage, try as much as you can to position the nozzle of your mist blower or your knapsack to the point that, that is the entrance to that, um, to that drainage. Pumping, you know, excessively. I tell you, whatever that is inside that drainage will come out. Then if you want to use your mist blower and um, your, 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 your fogger, that can do in a kind of super treatment. But if you use only the fogger, I'm sorry, you may not get the desired results that you want. Thank you very much. Thank you. That, that was a good uh, addition to what I've been trying to say. Thank you, Ma. <laughs> great, 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 great. All right, so let's move on. Okay, Sanitarian Obira, thank you for that uh, additional. I just want to take one more question. We have tons of people ready to ask questions. Part of this training is that uh, we have a WhatsApp group that we're going to try to add everybody so that uh, learning continues. You know, like the prof said, he said he went to a school for IPM for six months. It's not something you can get in 30 minutes. So, but what we have done is that we always get a way to to ensure that uh, we, we always get this hands-on advice every day. They, in fact, on our first control forum, is a place of professionalism where knowledge is passed every day, shared by professionals every day. So I know some of you that may still have questions, may be able to answer those questions in the long run. This is just like a tip of the iceberg and give you some certain insight. You know, we can keep talking about this for your own you know, for your own I'm just going to give one more person an opportunity to ask a question. I think I should give James C. Laurie. James C. Laurie is from Futa, I think. He's the head officer of Federal University of Technology. So let us give him the opportunity to ask his question and make his contribution. Thank you, Mr. James. Thank you, James, for, for coming to this course. Can you unmute yourself and ask a question after we should go to the next course? Mr. James, are you there? If he's not there, we can take Mr. Muidin. Can you hear me? I'm speaking. Oh, yeah, go on. We can hear you, sir. You can hear me. Uh, the problem I have is with my set. It's giving me a problem. I just want All to right. find out concerning, and um, can we have the notes or this idea and can we have handouts? Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you yes, understand sir, what I'm saying? I say, can we have the handouts on this thing? Yes, it will be made available, sir. Yeah, thank you. God bless you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, the fortune, I want to crave your indulgence. Uh, please, can we take uh, Muidin and Abel Misikiru? That's the last, please. Muidin, can you ask your question? Let's have, have you so that, that we can get, get yours. Muidin. Go ahead, sir, Mr. Muidin. The floor is yours. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. I think Muidin has been trying to ask questions even from the first class. I don't know, maybe his audio is not good. Maybe you should um, type it now. We can't hear you. Uh, the, um, your audio device is uh, malfunctioning. Uh, your, your mic is on and we can't just hear you. It says audio I device. Just type, type the question. All right. Okay, you can type, type the now. question. Mm. Prof is still inside the course, even while we introduce now the next class. Okay. Thank you so very much, Prof. If you choose, thank you for bringing the wealth of experience, wealth of knowledge. You know what it call, what it takes to call somebody, Prof. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I like the I like you know, and sincerely, everybody in this uh, class really enjoy the flow, the flow, the deep insight. We wish it's a, it's like a four hours course. 
Yes, you know, so. this your your, your course title is not what sixty minutes can do justice to. Yeah. That's why I even allow for us to have this extra time. And I know we will always have opportunity to enlighten, to improve yes. the technical capacities of practitioners in the industry, so that we can have a, an industry that we can all be proud of. That some people on the street that just carry uh, the DVP up and down, we're not going to bastardize the industry for all of us. That's the reason why training and retraining is very important, you know. Even though when you think you have all the certification, you know, prof says something about you may be certified quack. So mm -hmm. as much as the regulators are going to try to ensure they follow the due process to ensure you are qualified to, to be a practitioner. But indeed, you have the responsibility to keep improving yourself. In fact, PECAN as an association now is going around, we're uh, going to be doing a recertification process of some of these old members. You can imagine. That means you can say somebody can become an old PECAN member if you fail the recertification process. It's like a medical doctor. Like Prof said, your work is like a pharmacist, a doctor. You cannot misprescribe. That means if you don't keep, uh, some of you are saying, I cannot register for a training, 10,000. Some of guys that, that some of my guys on this call, they paid. They are here. You understand? So don't, don't when you have opportunity for it, there are some there's something new that you are going to pick. And imagine how many valuable thoughts I've picked myself, you know, on this call, this on this training today. And I really appreciate the facilitator for the for the effort for putting that together. We make available the the slides on the group and for everyone to have enough time to enjoy it. Thank you, Prof, once again. Thank you for being there for us. God bless You're welcome, you. Sir. Thank you. Now we're going to move to our third module for today. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something exciting is about to happen. Come on. You know, some of you, you just got a glimpse of who sanitary no barrier pressures is by with that insight she brought in. You know, sanitary no barrier is a very in fact, she's my personal EHO, you know? So she's my personal EHO. Imagine when the fortune has someone like Antonio Berry as his personal EHO for the past few, almost four years. No, <laughs> you can imagine the, the level of safety and many things we put into our operations. She's a no-nonsense woman, very detailed, very cere cerebral, full of information, practical information. I want you to pay the same attention to this class. And it's going to be, she's going to be teaching us on very sensitive areas of these things. Modu title is health, number one, health, safety, and management of risk on the field, of, on the field for service providers and chemical handlers alike. We all know chemical handlers, safety, everything that we do has to do with health and environment and people. And your life and the environment is better, is more important than the money you think you want to make. Sanitary Ogura will be doing justice to this in the next few minutes. And I want us to welcome her with, a, with, with an applause. Welcome, Sanitary Ogura. We are all ready with our pen and paper. We're going to be taking notes. Thank you. you can, we'll make you a call so you can share your slide. Thank yeah. you. The floor is yours now. Yeah. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me loud yeah. and clear. Okay. Yes. I say good afternoon once more. I think I'm, I'm, I'm delighted and privileged to be part of this um, wonderful training for today. And I also um, I kind of congratulate you too for being part of this um, moving train. Yeah, and I... <laughs> I um, plead with you that whatever you are learning here today, please make good use of it. And um, of course, God will continue to help and protect each and every one of us. So um, I'll be talking on um, health, um, safety management, um, in the handling of pesticides, in the operation that has to do with pesticide application and all that. Okay, so I'll be sharing my slide from here. 
Yes, we are talking about health, safety, and management of risks on the field of service providers and um, chemical handlers alike. Okay? Can you see the slide? Hello? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Yeah, we can see this one, yeah. Okay, yeah, we thank can you see very it. much. All right, thank you. Yeah, we can see it. All right. So, the outline of the slide will be talking about introduction, of course, definition of important terms, what we mean by health, safety, and management system. We call it HSCMS, as far as health and safety professionalism is concerned. And then we'll talk about the essential elements of HSC EMS. And then we'll talk about the analysis, risk assessment, risk evaluation for pest control service operation. You know, in this operation that we carry out, in this activity that we do on daily basis, you know, we have been exposed to different kinds of hazards and risks associated with these hazards. So we'll look at the assessment of this risk. We'll first of all look at the analysis of the risk, assess the risk, evaluate the risk as it concerns our operation. And then we'll take a time to look at health and safety procedures for the management of specific risk. Please, I want to beg you for um, a favor. Please, if you don't have a pen and paper, because I'm going to give you an assignment, and whether you like it or not, you will submit it at the end of this class. I can hear somebody laughing. Yes, you will submit it at the end of this class, and I will mark it. But on a more serious note, this is a very serious, important issue. When we talk about health, safety, environment management, it's a very serious issue. because. If we don't take care of our health and we are not conscious of safety and we don't put up, you know, management system in place to make sure that some of these hazards that we interface with on daily basis, as, as far as carrying out our operation is concerned and looking at possible ways by which we can, if possible, eliminate these hazards and do away with the risk associated with it. Or if we cannot, reduce the impact of these hazards and the risks associated. And find possible ways to ameliorate the impact, the consequences that come alongside with it. Sooner or later, we will end up making money that we may not be there to eat it. And I pray that it will not be our lot and it will not be a lot of anybody that is in this program as far as today is concerned. That's why I want you to be very, very, you know, um, attentive as you write down in this, um, in this module. Okay, now we look at the introduction. Of course, a company's viability is determined by its financial capability. Okay, that a company is viable, that a company is doing well, that a company is at the forefront is as a result of the financial capability that that company is having. And why is that financial capability coming in? Because of the increase in, um, in clientele, increase in business um, deals that the company is having. It's coming as a result of the financial strength of such company. It's coming as a result of the sum of businesses that that company is doing, okay? And of course, if, um, if um, the environment where this business is being done, if the environment where this business is being operated on is not safe and is not healthy, of course, then sooner or later, you begin to have issues, injuries resulting, illnesses coming up, even death can also occur to persons. It could be damage to assets. It could be you know, a dent in your reputation. That makes the environment at large. And of course, you know, when, when those kind of things are happening, what do you expect? Of course, you begin to see that the economy will begin to dwindle down. Employees will begin to leave you because nobody will want to work with a company where if you have any issue health-related wise, and they will lay you off. 
Before you know it, people will not want to, you know, to work with that company. And then, of course, clients will begin to withdraw their contracts from you, a company that has an issue of reputation. Who will want to invest in that company? Who will want to have business to do with that company? So that's why we take the issue of health and safety as far as pest management operation is concerned. Now, let me go over to definition of um, important terms. But before I do that, there's a story I want to tell because every time I'm handling this particular course or this particular module, I always love to share stories, experiences, you know, that I've um, gotten from people and all that. I remember a particular year, some years back, I had a friend, he is in this business and he's doing very, very well. He told me a story that really touched me, but God saved him. You know, they had um, business to do. They had a business to do with Fidelity Bank sometime around, uh, somewhere around the Kedja. And he, he, he went with some of these guys. And while they were at the banking hall working, I think the guy that was using the, the, the fogger, he didn't know how to use the fogger very well. And that's why when we'll be progressing in this particular uh, discussion, you will know that the importance of training your employee, it can never, never be overemphasized. You know, this guy was not properly trained in the handling, in, you know, when issues arises as a result of using fogger. You know, some of us carry fogger, carry fogger. That fogger you see can set a whole company ablaze if you don't know how to handle it. Because if you watch, when we use the fogger, look at the back of the fogger, you see one kind of flame that is at the back, you know? And the fogger is using diesel or kerosene, depending on the diluent you want to use. The fogger is using fuel, okay? And it's bringing out the temperature that is that is, 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 is being used, as far as that um, resonator is concerned, is about 1,300 degrees Celsius, the very high degree of temperature, okay? And it can lead to a very serious fire hazard. Now, what happened that particular day when that guy was in that banking hall working? I think the, the fogger suddenly stopped and, and the, 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 the CEO was downstairs. Thank God he came to that, that site with them. He was downstairs and the guys were up in the banking hall working. And of course, you know how the banking hall used to be everywhere, sealed up with glass and all that. And when the, 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 the fogger stopped working, you know, the guy didn't know the next step to do. Do you understand? He put the fogger down. And because there's still trails of diesel still coming out, the next thing, the diesel that dropped, you know, inside that resonator that was not converted, what happened that was that the, 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 the carbon, the carbon caught ignited and the fire and the, and the, and the fogger went on, on flame. And the guy was shouting, Emma, you know, Emma, me, Emma, me, oh, Emma, you know, that kind of a thing. And ah, the, the CEO was downstairs and they started hitting the glass. Oh, God, is fire, oh, God, is fire. And he couldn't hear. So fortunately, there was one of the glass that they could pull from, the, from that inside. So he climbed up, but he couldn't enter. He asked them to open that glass and throw the fogger from up down. Because the fire was a flame, the fogger was a flame. And that was how God helped them. They threw the fogger from that up to the down. And thank God there were no vehicles parked in that compound as at that moment. And that was what saved the situation. Of course, you cannot ask me what happened to the fogger. The fogger got finished. But what happened was that at least God helped them to survey that, that situation because that would have been a very serious blow on the reputation of that company. It would have, in fact, it would have been out of business. But God, so that's why when we talk about the issue of health and safety, it's something that we have to take very, very seriously as far as pest management and pest control process and, and oppression is concerned. Let's continue. Health. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity as stated by WHO. Of course, the clients, the employee, the business owner, and the nation at large needs good health to, of course, to have a sustainable development. 
when you talk about health, the state of optimum um, um, soundness of mind, physically you are okay to discharge your, um, your responsibilities as it ought to be. When your, your, your mind is settled, when your body is okay, when your, 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 your everything around you socially, you are okay. We say that you are what? You are healthy, okay? Your clients need to be healthy. Your employee needs to be healthy. The business owner, the CEO, the MD, you need to be healthy. And the nation, of, of course, is depending on you. The environment is depending on you. They need you. Everybody needs to be healthy, even as you carry on that your pressure to have what you call sustainable development. When we talk about sustainable development, sustainable development has to do with developments that bring joy, bring fulfillment to me and you as, as we speak. And then the future generation, happiness and fulfillment will not, will not be jeopardized. That is what is called sustainable development. And that's why in our business of pest management, we have to always have in mind this issue of sustainable development. You will not go and treat an environment and you devalue that environment. You will not go and treat somebody's house. Somebody contracted you to come and treat the house. And by the time you leave treating the house, that person is down with respiratory issue. You will not treat a factory and a worker in that factory that has asthma will develop seizure or asthmatic um, um, uh, symptoms. You know, you trigger the asthma in that person. That is not sustainable development. So in this context of what you are talking about, whatever oppression that we need to do, whatever thing that we need to do, as far as pest management is concerned, we have to have it at the back of our mind that the health of the people is paramount to our pressure, the health of your employee. You will not get somebody to work for you to make money. And then, of course, that person cannot be useful to himself in the next 10 years, in the next five years, in the next 20 years, because of the, the, the illness you have gotten as a result of exposure to the process of pest management oppression. Okay, now let's look at safety. Safety is a state in which one is free from danger or situation that can cause harm or injury to person, damage to equipment and damage to the environment. When we talk about safety, of course, any situation that can cause harm to injury to anybody, damage to any equipment, if you have to make that situation to be free from danger, we said you are doing what? You are doing safety uh, proceedings or safety procedures. Safety is very, very important. As far as this operation is concerned, you have to be safe to enjoy the process. Your employee has to be safe to keep working for you. Your client has to be safe to keep giving you job. The environment has to be safe so that you have more places to work on. And that's why safety is very, very important as far as this, this, um, this uh, profession and this job is concerned. Environment. Of course, environment has to do with the surroundings around you, the air you breathe, the land you walk on, the water you drink, the animals, the plants, lives, all of them are part of the environment. The biotic and the biotic um, um, aspect of the environment, the built and unbuilt aspect of the environment, they are all part of what we are talking about. The places where you need to render your service is part of the environment. The chemicals and the equipment you use is part of the environment. The facilities that you need to treat, the activities that goes on in carrying out that oppression, is part of the environment. All of these, okay, must be maintained in a helpful and safe state. If actually we want to sustain life and, um, and well-being as planned uh, in our stated objectives. Very, very important. Company. The company you are looking at here today is any organization that engages in pest control management and service provision. That's the company I'm looking at, okay? The company I'm looking at is that company that is as um, concerned with the day-to-day -day activities that has to do with pest control, pest management, and uh, pest-related services oppression. The practice, the practice we're talking about here
Okay, sorry for that interruption. Yeah, the practice, the practice has to do with, with acceptable methods or means of accomplishing a stated task. Practice has to do with the method you have designed to accomplish the task you have set up for yourself, for your company, as far as space management operation is concerned. Now the procedure, the procedure has to do with a documented series of steps to be carried out in a logical order for a defined operation or in a given situation, okay? When you document series of steps, steps of how to carry out your operation, like us in pest management, part of the step that we do as far as our operation is concerned is that when you get a, um, 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 an invite from your clients, well, first of all, go to the site or go to the place to do what we call site inspection. It's one of our, it's, it's, it's a very critical aspect of our um, oppression. It's part of our procedure. And then when you have procedures like this, okay, documented steps like this, documented, okay, on how you carry out, you know, your, 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 your oppression in a logical order. That is what is called procedure. In health and, and safety management, we call it what? Procedure. And every pest management organization must have a procedure of how they do things. And I always tell people, when you go out for inspection, to look out for the pest that you want to control and to decide the method you're gonna to use to control the pest, to decide the equipment you're gonna use in applying whatever you need to apply, you should also look at the safety aspects of that operation that you want to carry out. It should be an integral part of that your operation. Many of us, we, don't, we are interested in the pest. We are interested in the equipment. We are interested in the space. But sometimes we are not interested in the health and safety aspect. Many a times you go to client's place, who we'll forget to ask them some sensitive questions. It should be part of your inspection procedure. That inspection that you do to check out for the pest, to know the infestation level of the pest. You should also ask your health status, because it's very, very important. Because you know that what you're going to do, the operation you're going to carry out might impact the health of the people there. How old is the oldest person in that place? How young is the youngest person in that place? These things are very, very important. Do they have any respiratory related tract issue? These things are very, very important. So that you don't go to handle a situation and you end up creating a worse situation in that place. I remember a case that somebody shared a case with me Somebody, an operator went to a place to, to, to carry out pest, uh, pest uh, management operation. And by the time that person left, if or when he came, they did not know that they have an elderly woman in that house. And that woman was confined in a particular room. And when he came for inspection, he did not bother to ask, do you have any aged person here? Because some of these things that we use that we call pesticide, many of them are contraband for, for, some, age, from, for some age of people. You don't just open up pesticide when you have people that are 60 years and, 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 and above. You don't just open up any kind of pesticide when you have people that are two years below. You have to know the age of the people of the, of, of the people in that particular place that you need to work on. So that you will decide or you determine the kind of thing that you're gonna bring in there. You also decide whether you will do application or not, whether you even apply any pesticide or not. You can decide to use other means. And this person did not ask, he did not know, he came in. It was why he was working. And that woman, mama that was even in that place was an asthmatic woman. And of course, you know these things that will spray, all these agrochemicals that will spray. Immediately you open it up in a room, you will begin to perceive it in all the places. That woman ran out. The woman that, that could not work very well, she has to run out for her life. In fact, from that place, they moved that woman to the hospital. She had asthmatic seizure. So it's very, very important in your procedure, in that documented um, uh, steps that you need, health and safety process must be an integral part, okay? Hazard, hazard has to, has to, has to um, when we talk about hazard, we talk about um, potentials to cause harm. Anything that you work with, that has that ability to cause harm, it's referred to as a hazard, okay? It's, it includes ill health, 
or injury. Of course, the harm that it can lead to, it helps injury, damage to properties, plants, products, environment, and all that. Everything that we work with as far as, um, as, far as uh, pest management operation is concerned is a hazard. The fogger you carry is a hazard. The sprayer you are carrying is a hazard. The pesticide you are applying is a hazard, okay? A whole lot of things that we do. And that's why in, the, in environmental health, when we classify hazards, we classify hazards, they are physical hazards, they are um, biological hazards, okay? The press that we are combating, uh, that combating or, or, or that we are trying to fight against or trying to control is also a hazard on its own. It's a biological hazard, okay? We have chemical hazards like the pesticide I've mentioned, different, any kind of pesticide you can think about, whether the one they say is unlikely to cause harm, it's a hazard, okay? And then we have um, psychological hazards when there is um, no good flow of relationship between workers and between employer and employee, it's also a hazard because the relationship that is ongoing in your office can make or mar your oppression. If, if your worker is not having the right mind, uh, frame of mind, he can go there and, 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 and it constitute a very serious issue. Yes, if his mindset is not okay. If psychologically it's not okay. And that's why in this process, there's a whole lot of things that you as a manager, you as, as a business owner, a whole lot of things you need to put in place if you want a, a, a HSC management, a, a whatever to work effectively for you. You have to study the psychology of your staff because their, 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 their behavior, their whatever can constitute a problem, a hazard. We call it psychological hazard. We have economics, man-machine relationship. And that's why before you give anybody the opportunity to carry any kind of equipment, you must ensure that that's, that equipment is suitable for that worker and that worker is suitable for that equipment. Somebody that is not well groomed in carrying, in using mist blower, you don't dare it. It might end up constituting a very serious issue because it's dealing with hazard. Okay. Okay, now we look at risk. Risk is the product of the chance, the possibility, the probability that a specific undesired event will occur and the severity of the consequences of such events when there is a likelihood that something undesirable will happen in the process, irrespective of what is in, what in, you know, you're, you're using, we call it what? Risk. So this pest management oppression is full of risk, okay? The pesticide we use have a whole lot of, you know, likelihood of issues happening as far as we use that pesticide. The equipment we use, we have a whole lot of issues that might arise as a result of using that. So all those things are called risk, okay? So when there's a likelihood that something can happen along the line of your pressure, and okay, and, and also uh, the, 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 if, if you can quantify the severity of the consequences of such events, we call it what? Risk. Incidence. Incidence is an event or change illness and or damage, loss to assets, the environment, or even to third party, okay? So incident is that something likely may happen or that an event might likely happen or it, it happened. When it has happened, we call it what accident. But when it is near miss, we call it what incident. Something happened or something could happen. When that thing has happened, and of course, <laughs> that's when we call it what? Accident. And that's why I tell people that all accidents are incidents, but all incidents are not accidents, okay? But when you begin to have frequency of incidents occurring, management plan that you put in place and be sure that that plan is working. If it's not working, you have to do what? You have to re-strategize and replan so that you don't, you don't um, um, experience some of these things that people in the past had experienced, okay? Pep talk. When we talk about pep talk, pep, pep talk has to do with, um, you know, talk given to operators before they start out for any given operation. 
system. In fact, I do that a lot. And it's something I encourage that every organization should do it. Okay? Before you set off for an oppression, even sometimes right at the site of that oppression, you should have what we call the pep talk. Do a little talk of what you people have come here to do. Remind them of the risks, the hazards associated with what you people are there to do. And then make sure that everybody must comply with whatever measure that you have put in place to ameliorate any impact or any eventuality that will occur. Okay, that talk is what we call the pep talk. Don't just allow them to enter the vehicle, zoom out. Always have what we call the pep talk. It's part of the integral aspect of um, environmental money, um, health, safety, and environment management system. Okay, environmental effects. Environmental effects has to do with direct or indirect um, impediments of the activities, products, services of a company upon the environment, whether that, that, that uh, effect is adverse or beneficial. But most times in environmental effects, we'll look at the adverse impediment of activities on the environment, on, 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 on activities and all that, okay? And then as low as practicably, um, reasonably practicable. You may be hearing that. You may be seeing the um, acronym. We call it A-L-A-R-P, ALARP, as low as reasonably practicable. This is simply a principle that is used in um, satisfying a requirement to keep the risk level as low as possible. In HSC management, we always talk about this alarm, okay? And you can only, uh, you know, achieve a reasonable, um, 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 a reasonable, um, 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 how will I put it? Um, a reasonable um, uh, success when you have actually analyzed your process identified all your risks and hazards associated, the hazards associated and the likelihood of those hazards causing problem, which is the risk. And then you begin to put, you know, we'll see that as we progress, you begin to put measures, okay? That is the only place you can get to this point that is called as slow as reasonably practicable. That whatever thing you need to do is a principle that you must ensure that your process will lead to as low as reasonably the, 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 you know, the, the, the injury, illness, risk, whatever. You always make sure that your process is brought to the level as low as reasonably, possibly practicable, that issues may not arise as a result of, of your oppression. Health, safety, and environment uh, management system, critical activities, okay? Here we we'll talk about activities, personnel, or measures that have been identified as um, vital to ensure asset integrity, ensure and um, prevent incidents, and all to mitigate adverse HSC effects. Okay, those activities, the personnel, the measures that you have identified in your process. Okay and also look at them to ensure that your asset integrity is maintained. Accident and incident or whatever is prevented. And you have put up measures to mitigate any kind of impact that will arise as a result of that oppression. We said what is HSCE critical issue or critical matter, okay? Now health, safety and environment management plan. A HSC management plan is a description of the measures of achieving health. The measures you've put in place to achieve optimum health, to achieve optimum safety, and achieve the environmental objective your organization has set. That is what we call the HSC environmental management plan. And then what is HSC um, environment management? The HSC um, environment management is the overall management function, is the overall management function, including planning, okay, that develops, implements, 
and maintain the HSC policy. In fact, here, I usually tell people that HSC management initiative is a top bottom initiative. It's not a bottom top issue. It's a top bottom issue. That means it has to start with you and me, um, the, you and I, okay? Those of us that are the MDs, the CEOs and all that. It starts with us. We are the custodians of that management system. We are to set things in order. We are to put plans in place. We are to develop whatever we need to work with as far as HSC is concerned. And we are to ensure that implementation is done without looking at anybody's face. Because when, if anything goes wrong, it is you and I that will face the consequences. Okay? So that's why it's a management issue. Okay? And then health, um, health, safety, and environment policy. The health, safety, and environment policy is a policy statement of the intentions and principles of action of the company regarding its health, the safety, and environmental effects, giving rise to its strategic and detailed objectives. Sometimes when you get to companies, you see their uh, policy statements. It's part of HSC plan, okay? Every organization must have what you call HSC policy. Because that policy is, is, is a statement of intent that this organization, you know, start to do this, do that, do that. Just sometimes it could be a one line, two line, three line statement, okay? But that statement is, it's, um, okay, in health and safety, uh, you know, um, uh, based so that anybody that comes in will look at what the company uh, believe on as far as health and safety is concerned, okay? And then it's with that policy, you begin to bring out the objective that you want to use to do what? To achieve that policy, okay? That's why the HSC environment strategic objectives has to do with the broad goals arising from the HSC policy, I've said that before, okay? So the objectives, the strategic objectives is designed to, 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 um, satisfy or to ensure that the policy is achieved, okay? To satisfy the main goal of that policy. Very, very important. Okay? Now, health sector and environment management system. The system has to do with the company structure. It has to do with responsibilities. It has to do with practices. It has to do with procedures. It has to do with process. It has to do with resources that is made available for the, the, the implementation of the health, safety, and environment management. Let's go to HSC, um, HSC MS. That is Health, Safety, and Environment Management System. Of course, according to the ENP Forum, HSC management system is a company structure, responsibilities, practice, procedure, process, and resources for implementing health, safety, and environmental management. It is also the quality management system for managing the risk in the company to ensure the protection of these people, assets, and their reputation, and the protection of the environment the company operates within. So that system that your company puts in place to ensure that you take, make sure that you have a structure on ground, Make sure that you have responsibilities that you give to people to do to make to ensure that health, health and safety is paramount. The practices that you, you, uh, you undergo, the procedure you put in place, like you talked about earlier, okay? The resources you make prov provision for, all these things must be there for the actualization of the implementation of health and safety plans that you have in place. And that is what HSEMS is concerned. The three main components are one, commitment and leadership. HSC management system in pest management operation. The three components is one, commitment and leadership. CEOs must be committed and be at the forefront in making sure that safety, health, safety, and, 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 and um, environmental management is paramount in their every of their of the operation and discussion. Okay? Implementation of new policies and risk management. These are the three important things. Commitment and leadership, implementation of the policy, and the risk management. Very, very important. Let's look at the HSC 
MS elements. One, leadership and commitment. I've said that before. As a leader, as a CEO, as a company owner, as a manager, because you are part of the leadership, you have a responsibility to make sure that HSC works in your organization. The health, safety, and environment management system works. You have to set it in place. You have to design a policy and strategic objective. You set objective that will help in the actualization of that policy. Your organization, you have to organize your, 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 your system so that everybody knows what to do. So people are responsible for something. You don't leave people, you don't, you don't just leave them to do whatever they like to do. Oh, we have work to do at Iketa. You go get the machine. You go do that. No, you have to make sure that people are responsible and they are all to that responsibility. That if anything goes wrong, they are to be held accountable. That's responsibility. And you don't just run Helter Skelter. You must make sure that people are responsible as far as achieving HSC is concerned. Resources, you must make resources available. Sometimes I see people in first moment of pressure, it bleeds my heart. That people are working, no, no common hand glove, no resources. And you are talking about HSC, no good respirator, no good standard PPE. These are the things that you have to look at as far as HSC management is concerned. You have to, HSC management um, um, system, one of the elements again is hazards and effects management. I have to look at the hazards because that's what we're going to do. That's why I said you should get a bio, get a, pa get a, a paper, because all of us, we will begin to atomize all the hazards that we think is a, we, we, you know, we, are, we are being exposed to or is inherent in our pressure. Okay? And then we'll begin to look at how to do what to, you know, uh, um, uh, provide solutions so that issues will not arise as a result of exposure and allowing those hazards to thrive in our pressure. Hazard and effect management. Planning and procedures you must put plans in, all, in, in place. Procedures to, to, to do all that, the sequence of steps to make sure that whatever you need to do is done and done as ought to be done. Implementation and monitoring. Whatever you have planned, whatever you have put in place, all the objectives and all the things you need to achieve, the objective that will achieve your overall policy and goal, of course, you have to implement it. And as you're implementing, you have to monitor. You don't say, yes, I provided all the resources. Uh -huh. I, they have PPE. They do this, they do that. Are you monitoring? Once in a while, and some of us, we have now grown so big that we don't even go to site to check what these guys do. Some of them don't make use of these things we provide. Some of them, even when they do, they do haphazardly. Sometimes you bump in them. Sometimes you go check what they're doing. You monitor. And if anybody's erring, of course, you know what to do because it's part of the system you have put in place. And then once in a while, you audit. You can do external audits, you can do internal audits to you know, look at the overall process and see needs to review, needs bring in new things, new ideas and all that. Okay, now let's look at hazard and effect management system. Because this, this hazard and effect management system is the integral part of HSC MS. The overall concept of HSC MS is embedded in hazard and effect management system. And when we talk about hazard and effect management system, we are looking at four elements. And these four elements are one, hazard identification. I hope you're with your viral and your pen. Risk assessment, risk control, and recovery measures. These are the four basic integral aspects of um, the elements of HSC, uh, that's hazard and effect management system, okay? Now let's look at hazard identification. The hazard identification, because you, you cannot control what you don't know. I always tell people, you cannot control what you don't know. You must know what you want to control. And it starts with identification. The same thing we do in, when we go out for our inspection and all that. You cannot control what you don't identify. When you get to a place, try to shout, a shout, a shout, a, ah, is this one that is doing me? Hey, I, I think I, I, I saw a rat in my house. He may be lizard that is in his house, and he saw the way the team move. He says it's right. You have to go there to be sure it is right. That is the essence of inspection, and make sure that actually what I'm coming to combat with is what is um um a rat. The same thing in hazard identification. 
you must identify the hazard. Now begin to look at our oppression as pest management um, operators, as people that work, employees in, in, in pest management operation organization. Begin to identify the hazards that, you know, that we see in our day-to-day -day oppression, okay? Look at the risk involved. Look at, look at the hazards, identify the hazards and the risk that is involved. Look at the pesticide you are using, is it a hazard? Is there any risk involved in it? Look at the equipment you are using, is it a hazard? Is, it, is there any risk involved in it? Look at the activities that you go on, uh, you carry out in a, in a, at the site. Is there hazards associated with it? Some of us will go as far as climbing a very, a very um, um, a serious height, you know, to control some pets. Some has to enter the roof. Some has to, you know, a whole lot of things. Begin to analyze these activities and identify the hazards that you think that is associated with this and begin to look at the risk that is associated with these hazards that you identify. I hope you are doing that. I hope you are doing that. Now, these hazards can be identified through experience, driven judgment, use of checklists, use of references to regulations, codes or standards, okay? You can draw up your, your, your hazards from some of these. But I tell you that those of us that is in this oppression, no, if you are really in it, you don't need, you don't need, you don't need any code of conduct, a new code of whatever, because you know it is it's glaring, it's looking at us. So you, you need to use your viral and begin to list it out one by one. Now, after you have identified this hazard, the next thing is the risk assessment or the risk evaluation. All these hazards you have identified. You have to start determining the likelihood of, of that hazard to cause injury. What is the likelihood of the pesticide you are using that it will cause injury? What is the likelihood of that equipment you are using, whether it is mini fodder, whether it is a, 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 a thermal fodder, whether it's UFV, whether it's a, a, a knapsack, the backpack, whether it's motorized, which, which one, whether it's tractor mounted, any one of them, begin to look at it. Is there any likelihood that that could be, you know, injuries resulting as a, as, as a result of using that? Could, could, could the usage of any of this result to illness? Could it result to damage to health of any of your predators? Could it result to damage to, to the health or properties of your clients? Could it result to damage your assets? The assets you spend so much money to buy. Today, well, I'm Hello. Hello. I'm 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 Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you're audible now. All right, all right. Thank you very much. Okay, I hope you are following me. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, so we are in risk assessment and risk evaluation. And I said that um, you have to start looking at all the things that we we'll work with, the chemicals we we'll work with, the equipment we we'll work with, the environment where we we'll work, and the process you know, the activities we carry out in, in making sure that our oppression goes seamless, okay? You have to look at them. Are there, are there hazards um, um, inherent in them? Are there likelihood of this, of this um, 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 hazard resulting to issues, injury, illness, or damage to health of your predator? Damage to the health and, 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 and the equipment of your clients? Damage to assets, your own assets? 
I have the, uh, uh, this, um, um, uh, what's it called? This is a German fog. The swing fog is about 850,000, 900,000 naira now. Okay? So you can imagine, uh, you know, investing in this kind of assets. And because you don't put HSC management plan in place, and something happens along the line, and that fogger is, um, <laughs> you understand what I mean? It's not funny. Or you carry fogger to go to a place to work, and due diligence is not taken as far as HSC is concerned. And you set the whole company or the whole place ablaze. You can imagine what that means. That is a very serious issue on, um, on assets, whether the asset is from your client side or from your own side. Reputation. You have to look at, is there any, any, anything that can result to risks that will damage my reputation? Is there any, 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 any asset that I have identified that can you know, have the propensity to, to damage the environment? Okay, you list all that out. And then when you list out all this, um, the next thing we do, the next thing we do, the risk management or risk control. Because when you finish identifying, evaluate the, 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 the chances of such hazards resulting to serious risk posing as risk that can damage life and health damage your reputation as a company damage your assets damage your clients life or their properties and the environment when you have analyzed all this you now come to what we call the risk mitigation or risk control i hope you have listed all the hazards and the likelihood of the hazards constituting problem to us. Now, when we talk about the risk mitigation or risk control, it has to do with risk reduction measures that reduces the risk and their effects. And it also reduces the consequences, okay? Because when you're reducing the, the risk and their effects, of course, you're reducing the consequences that will arise if such risk is not um, um, taken out of the way. And in mitigating or controlling risk, we have what we call one, eliminate the risk, two, substitute the process, engineering control, administrative control, and personal protective equipment. Okay? So we have elimination process. Okay? Elimination process has to do with physically removing the hazard. When you physically remove a hazard, is there any hazard in your process that you think you can physically remove? Yeah, you can physically remove so that it will not result to unwarranted effects and, 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 and subsequent consequences. Okay? You physically do that. Now, when it is not possible to do that physical removal of the hazard, that's where we'll fall to the next one, which we call replace the hazard. Now, we do that a lot when it comes to pesticide. Okay? Now, sorry, before I go to that second one, let me just talk about the physical, this one now. In this elimination process, to me, to do the work of the process, when you go to a place, to a, a particular facility, and you have analyzed all that you need to do, you have done your inspection and you have done your HSC analysis because it's very, very important. HSC analysis must be one of the integral parts of your inspection, uh, um, your facility inspection. Put it, include it there. It's very, very important. You have look at the whole place, whether that facility is a personal house, whether that facility is whatever. You look at it. If you perceive that using pesticide here is not, it's not, Going to be going to work because of the things you've seen around. Like, let me take for instance, a client called you, and that client has a child of three months. Three months, or let me say, a child of less than a year, and you get into that place. Of course, the next thing that should come to your head shouldn't be pesticide application, if you know what you're doing, and if you if you're in line with me as far well as this HSC is concerned, it shouldn't be pesticide. So you should think about any other thing to do. And that's why we have different methods of pest control. You can decide to use biological method. 
you can decide to use physical method. You can decide to use, uh, you know, you know, um, maybe um, yeah, what do you call it? This uh, um, uh, when we talk about this uh, rights issue and all that um, exclusion method, you can decide to use that. Okay, provided that you will not use pesticide in that place for the health of that child. Any child that is still below one year, the respiratory system has not actually developed very well. And they're so susceptible to any of these things that will spray out, okay? For, to any of these things, whether you call it indoor residual spray chemical or whatever, their respiratory system is so, so susceptible. So in that situation, always analyze your, 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 the place you want to work and make sure if elimination process is, is going to work there, if elimination, remove, eliminate a, a hazard that, that you know can constitute a very serious risk and issue in that place. That's what I, that's what I, I mean by elimination process, physically eliminate or remove the hazard. Because you know that one of the hazards we have identified now if you have actually done the assignment with me, is what our pesticide that we work with. Okay. Now let's go to the second one, which I said it is substitution. Now, if you get to the facility and you see that, of course, you must use chemical control, which we always say is the last resort as far as IPM process is concerned. Now you now look at what kind of pesticide would I use. You begin to analyze the pesticide. What kind of pesticide should I use? Should I use a kind of phosphate? Should I use uh, organochlorine? Should I use? Now you begin to look at the hazards associated with all this. Of course, you know that organochlorine, you cannot near it because it's already banned. Okay? Organochlorine, organophosphate, you look at it. Of course, those ones are the, one of the most poisonous substances we ever work with. That's the truth, whether you like it or not. Organophosphate, and that's what food the market. Most uh, developed countries are not using it anymore. And that's why they're shipping it down here so that we can use it and kill, our, kill ourselves. Okay? So you look at it. Substitution, I have to replace this hazard. You replace the high risk hazard with less one, you replace it, okay? You can decide to use paretron, you can decide to use nicotinoid, you can decide to use any other that will make that, you know, the chances of the hazard there will be less. That is what we call the substitution method. Now the engineering control. The engineering control has to do with isolate people from the hazard. You know, sometimes some of us will go to a particular facility to work and people are still there. We are in a hurry to work and go. We are in a hurry to work and go. especially when some of us that are CEOs and managing directors are not closing in on these guys. Sometimes they go to site, they're in a hurry to, to do this thing. Some of them say, I want to do this pest control with swag. They want to quickly swag their swag and, 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 and zoom out. They will not wait for, for, you know, the last person to exit that place. They will open up their street. And before you know it, you begin to have complete, you begin to have issues. Some people, I've, I've, I've had, you know, I've had, uh, you know, uh, uh, issues and whatever that people are still in the office and somebody is, is applying pesticide. That's not, it's not, it's not part of HSC at all. Okay? So, engineering control is not only when you use machine, engineering control has to do with isolate people. Yes, anything you can do, you can take them to another space. You can, you know, all that and all that. You can, whatever you need to do to make sure that you take them out of that space. Isolate them from whatever hazard that is, you know, inherent in that process. That is what is called administrative control, okay? And then the next one, which is always the last, is the PPE, the personal protective equipment. Of course, in the hierarchy of um, control, the hierarchy of, of risk mitigation, PPE is always the last resort. And you still find that as some of us, you know, still falls in this one. PPE, do you provide adequate PPE for your, for, your, for your employee? And even when you are in a particular facility, sometimes these facilities will mandate somebody to supervise what you are doing. Do you go with an extra extra PPE for this person? HSC plan will put that person into, into your process because you will consider that person. You will know that somebody, a supervisor in that company will work around, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, alongside with your guys. You have to make provision for an extra PPE, an extra nose mask, you understand? 
an extra, put it in their bag, put it in their, in their, in their, in their, in their, in their, in their luggage. So that when they get there, they will give it to that, that um, uh, 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 survivor so that his or our own health and, and, and safety will be covered, okay? Now let's talk about the PPE. Of course, we all know it, we all use it. Our helmets, why do you use helmets? To cover your head so that, you know, to avoid heavy things falling on you or even you hitting your head. Sometimes when we are walking, we'll climb heights and all that, especially when some of us work in a construction site, you know, you know sometimes they, they set up all these scaffolds and all that. And then there could be possibility of exposure of your head to, you know, some of these things. If you're not putting on a helmet, you might be exposing your head to very serious, you know, you know, hazards, okay? And that could result to head injury. So helmet is very, very important. Don't say, ah, what do I need it for? You need it to cover your head. And let me tell you something. It has been discovered that the head is part of the root via which pesticide gets into the body very fast, especially for the men that usually have skin. They, they know they cut their hair to give their side a cause skin, that their head will be so, no hair at all. It exposes the, the, the head region to, you know, absorption of this pesticide drift that is coming out. So you need it. In fact, these days, what most of us do is that in our, in, in, in that's your um, uh, work clothes that you design, you make sure that it has a hood. So that when you put on the hood, if you, you cannot put on the helmet and then the hood will cover the back of your neck and all that, very, very important. The first shield is to cover your face so that the drift doesn't get to your face because sometimes when you are applying, of course the drift will return back, okay? Even though you need to watch the, 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 the movement of the wind, but sometimes even when you're inside and you are applying, that's the possibility of the drift coming back to you. So you need that shield so that it doesn't get to your face. Eyes is another, Thing that absorbs the pesticide very, very fast, okay? You need the first mask, respirator, okay? The respirator I'm talking about here is not this dust, dust mask. I, I feel sad when I see some, you know, video clips of people that call themselves professional IPM operators. And what they're using in the application of pesticide is this COVID-19 mask. This COVID-19 mask. You are just killing yourself gradually, okay? You must make sure that the nurse mask you, you, you are using or you are providing for your employee is no mask that has a very good respirator. I always advocate for 3M. 3M still stands for the, uh, the best for me. Of course, I know there are others, there is Vector and all that, but 3M is still good. It's still, uh, to me, is one of the best. Let me just use that, one of the best, okay? So please, don't expose these employees to, you know, you know, Inhale poison by inhalation. And don't expose your client to poison by inhalation. Don't encourage people to come around where you're mixing and where you are applying pesticide. Okay? Long sleeve overall, very, very important. Rubber gloves, very, very important. Some people will oh, bare hands and they're applying pesticide. I, oh my God. Okay? And uh, your boots, you must have a chemical resistant boot, not canvas, not a uh, palm. I have seen a lot of videos. You see somebody wearing slippers. Eh? Slippers. I said one day somebody will even go barefooted. Okay? <laughs> Hello? 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 Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. It is, we are enjoying it. All we right. can hear you, ma'am. All right. Okay? So I mean the rubber boots. The boots, rubber boots doesn't allow pesticide to be absorbed through them, okay? They're not doing fashion when you're applying pesticide. You're not doing some say they're doing swag. Please don't do swag with pesticide. It's one of the most serious hazards I've ever seen as far as face management oppression is concerned. Don't joke with it. So you have to have a good rubber boot, okay? That is what? That is chemical resistant. Very, very important. If you're the habit of wearing slippers, wearing palm, going barefooted, in applying pesticide, please, this is for me. Your body, our skin absorbs pesticide, okay? Probably maybe in another training, we'll be, we'll be looking at, uh, you know, toxic dynamics and toxic kinetic of this pesticide. You, in fact, you, you will begin to, maybe that's when some of us begin to wake up from this sleep, okay? Now, let's look at another aspect, training and, 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 and supervision. 
training as, as what we are doing now, okay? You train your staff, in-house training, outdoor training, online training, a whole lot of training going on as far as best um, um, uh, risk mitigation in, in pest management operation is concerned. Supervision, when you train, don't leave your staff to their faith. Make sure you close in on them. Some of us have grown so big that we don't check on these guys and check what they are doing in the field. Some of them will provide these PPEs and they don't use it. These children, these workers, these people, our brothers, they're exposing themselves. It's, it's more like a time bomb that is waiting to explode. Let's supervise them. Warning signs, measures. Put up a warning sign. In fact, recently, that's what I did. Have a very beautiful grown up warning sign. Anywhere I'm going, any job we have, I'll put it in the car. They'll carry it along. If I'm going to go with them, in fact, I'm the one that will set it. Because you know, some people, they want to see, they want to look. Some people, when you are working, they may not know that something is happening there. But when you put that sign outside the gate of that facility or wherever, of course, it's a warning sign telling them danger, something is happening, clear off, you understand? So it's part of the risk mitigation measure, okay? Good housekeeping. There's some of us that are zero when it comes to good housekeeping. They will provide these PPEs, but, you know, keeping them the way it ought to, you don't care. Please, good housekeeping is very, very important. In that your store, where you pack equipment, pesticide and all that, how is that stuff? Is it just somebody just jumping, uh, scrambling and be looking for something? The store is like, I don't even, like, like what man uh, 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 color, you know? This nothing has head, nothing has tail. Do you understand? It's, it's, it's also risk, it's risk, if you don't know. So a good housekeeping is a mitigating uh, measure to reduce the impact of risk. Because somebody might be looking for something that's crumbled and hit his head on the machine that is packed there, or one, one alarm somewhere who took him in the eyes. <laughs> you, you'll be thinking, how will it happen? It can happen. In HSC, we always imagine the unimaginable. That's what we are taught. Imagine the unimaginable. If we say the unimaginable, do you understand? And that will help you and keep you, you know, you know, at, at a point that you need to always think of safety. Imagine it. Even if it seems as if uh, can this one happen? Imagine it and put up measures to you know for some such. Okay. Then the next one is risk recovery. Risk recovery has to do with recovery plans, which you know mainly owners um, the risk of uh, destruction of to business processes risk of life to uh, employees and assets recovery, okay? And of course, in doing this, that is where insurance policy comes in, okay? That's where insurance policy comes in. That's some organization that you want to work for, they'll be asking you, do you have insurance policy or this or that? It's not a mere, it's not, it's not for fun. It's that serious about it because it's part of risk re recovery process, insurance plan, okay? Despite all the possible measures that you can take to reduce the impact of hazard, there are some that is bound to happen, okay? There's a possibility of the occurrence of incidents which could result in losses. Yes, always know that, that something can happen, okay? Either by commission or by omission, okay? And then that's where insurance comes in, okay? And insurance policy, is most suitable when the severity of the risk is high, but the frequency of that risk happening is low. I hope you understand this point. The severity of the risk happening is high, but the frequency of that risk happening is what is low. That when that risk happens, the severity, the impact you will have as a result of that risk is high. But the frequency of that risk happening is what is very, very low. And that's from the basis of some of these policies that we see here and there, whether it's third party, whether or whatever, okay? And some of these are, um, some of these, um, uh, these things can be damaged to customer's property. Some of these um, high frequency, but um, um, no high uh, rated risk, but low frequency, okay? 
damage to customers' property, if you put HSC in plan very well, yes, the, the chances of it happening is low, but when it happens, of course, the severity may be high. Professional liability risk is there. Auto accident risk is there, okay? And then um, harmful chemicals that may leak out is also there. It's part of what we have insurance for. Some of the insurance products suitable for pest control service uh, um, services suppression include pollution and fumigation liability. I don't think this one is in Nigeria now, but it's in US. Professional liability, business auto insurance, like this our auto third party insurance and all that. Tools and equipment coverage insurance, workman compensation insurance. I think this one we have it. Employ employee group life insurance. All these are our heads. Uh, uh, NHS and NIHS, or whatever. This is a national health insurance, whatever scheme is part of it. Okay. Workman compensation, like those of us that service um, oil um, producing um, uh, companies, the demand for some of this indemnity um, insurance and all that. Okay. Because they know that something can happen. Okay. Now, uh, pest inspection damage liability. I don't think that one is. A for now. Now, I want Now, the specific risk, I don't know the number of risks you have itemized in that your paper, but I'm picking one, and that one I'm picking is what? Pesticide. I'm picking it, okay? Now, this one, for us to mitigate and to ensure Maximum safety as far as pesticide usage and application is concerned. We have to look at adherence to instructions on the pesticide label and the MSDS. Very, very important. Sometimes I hear people argue what I don't know. You cannot just go to the market and buy something that you've not studied the label and you carry it and run off to a, a client's facility and you start applying. Are you okay? It's not done. You must adhere to the instruction on the pesticide label. You must read the label. It's M-U-S-T in capital letter. It is part of the integral aspect of HSC plan as far as pest management operation is concerned. Two, adherence to the golden rules as application in pesticide, uh, as applicable in pesticide um, purchase, pesticide storage, pesticide mixing, pesticide application, and final disposal. There's what we call the golden rule in environmental health. As far as pesticide application and safety is concerned. We have it in the purchase, okay? You don't just go and purchase what you don't know something about. And you must purchase what is suitable for what you are looking for, what you want to control. It's part of that golden rule, okay? In the storage, you must ensure that pesticide is stored in a conducive environment. You don't store pesticide in places where the temperature is high because most times the active ingredient is, 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 you know, is affected. Very, very important. If you store pesticide wrongly, you will, that pesticide will lose its potency. Know it today. Like some of us that sometimes when we go to buy pesticide and you see people that display pesticide under the sun, most times something that, you, that thing that you are buying that is under the sun is, is not, in fact, the active ingredient has, has been finished. Because the sun, the sun, the sun, uh, the, it, 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 the high temperature affects the potency of some of these active ingredients. Okay, so you must ensure that that golden rule is put in place. Store it well. Store it under lock and key. Store it out of reach of people that are not authorized to use it. In your mixing, mix pesticide as stipulated in the label. Don't over mix pesticide. Don't under mix pesticide, and that's where calibration comes in. Okay. You mix pesticide. Don't allow people to cluster where you're mixing pesticide. It's part of the golden rule. Okay? Application. When you're applying pesticide, there are also golden rules that you have to, you have to, you know, you know, uh, 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 adhere to. You don't eat alongside applying pesticide. Somebody is applying pesticide, and before you know it, you say, hey, please, remove bonds. You remove your mask. You remove your hand glove. Yeah, I'm hungry. I don't want to further here. Why didn't you eat before you start that operation? There is possibility of pesticide getting into you through that rubbish that you are doing. Okay, now 
provision of first aid. Um, okay, sorry. The next one is adherence to personal application equipment instructional ma uh, manual as stated by the manufacturer. Very, very important. When we buy application equipment, personal application equipment, do you adhere to the instruction given by the manufacturer? Or some of us, you know, with Sabi, you, you over syllabus used to worry us. If you understand, by the time you have done the damage, you now remember there's a manual that accompanies that equipment. That's when you remember the manual. When you have already destroyed the equipment and maybe you have even caused damage to your business. Okay, so always adhere to personal application equipment, professional manual that the that the manufacturer provides. Okay. And then the next one is um, uh, provision of first aid materials. First aid materials is also part of the management system specific for the risk I'm talking about. A whole lot of us, we don't have first aid materials. And some that have is not commensurate to the oppression we are doing. It's not suitable for the oppression we are doing, okay? Having first aid is one. Is it useful? What are you doing? The third is, do you know how to use the first aid? And that brings me to the point. If there is need for us as business owners to begin to um, look into training one of our, uh, you know, management team or employee as a first aider. Very, very important. Okay. Now, knowledge of first aid. Principles as regards pesticide poisoning is very, very important. I just said that now. Okay. You need to know what to do when pesticide, you know, enters, there are no scratches on your skin. You need to know what to do when pesticide enters your eyes. You need to know what to do when pesticide is inhaled. You need to know what to do when pesticide is swallowed. Okay. And there's this thing I need to correct here. Please, when people swallow pesticides, it's not every pesticide poison that you begin to induce vomiting. It's very, very wrong to induce vomiting. In fact, it is suicidal to induce vomiting for pesticide poisoning that arises as a result of maybe that poisoning is acid, alkaloid, and all that. Even this emulsifiable concentrate. You know the issue. When you induce vomiting, the way that acid went into the body, that is also the same way. And the impact can also, so it can burn the system. And sometimes it can even damage the lungs, the alveoli and everything connected to the respiratory system. So that's why in health and safety, we don't encourage people to do what? To induce vomiting when pesticides have been swallowed. Always make sure, don't do over syllables. Do what you know. Don't overdo. Don't do what you don't know, because that could be what jeopardizing life and health, you know, at that point. Okay. Now the next one, of course, when pesticide splashes the, the skin, you need to flush off your skin under running water and make sure that you remove that uh, um, um, contaminated um, PPE and then take the person out of the place where such contamination was done. And of course, let the person's body be kept dry and all that, okay? When pesticide enters the eyes, make sure that you use water to, you know, wash out the eyes, if possible, running it out, you know, let it wash the eyes as quickly as possible. You have to go highly often and wash as quick running water, okay? Position to do that, okay? You have to wash And don't use chemical or drug, okay? When there is splash of pesticide in the eyes, never you use chemical or any eye drug, whatever. You may be just increasing the injury, okay? Now, when chemical is inhaled, when chemical is being inhaled, of course, what you need to think is that you have to take the different air immediately. If there are other people near or within that area, you have to warn them of danger and let them leave that place. You have to lose the tight clothes that the person is wearing. You have to lose it. Okay? 
and then you have to apply artificial um, respiration, breathing has stopped. Or if you notice that the freaking skin is turning blue. But you know, these days we do what we call CPR, okay? That is cardiopulmonary resuscitation, okay? If you know how to do it, if you don't know, like I said, don't do over syllabus. Make sure you, in fact, part of the HSC plan is that you must have a nearby hospital to your workplace that you register your company with in case of eventuality, okay? But there are small, small things that you can do to save the life of that person, okay? And that's what we are talking about. If you can do artificial res um, 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 respiration, fine. If you can do CPR, fine. If you cannot, okay, make sure that the airways is, 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 is open to allow people to cluster that place so that the person can you know, take in, in air while you are with um, a medical expert to come and help you. I'm still saying it again. Every pest management company need to train one of their employee or any of the management team in first aid. Very, very important because you may not know when something will go wrong, okay? The next is when there is um, pesticide, when pesticide is being swallowed, you allow the person to take water, knock, knock water to be taken in, raise the mouth, drink water, give the victim right amount of milk or water to drink, or to some water, induce vomiting, if it's short, 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 in the level of that pesticide. I said it before. Never use that. Oh, yeah, vomit. You start putting hand in somebody's mouth. Don't try it. If the instruction in the pesticide says so, but if not, don't ever try it. You might end up killing that victim and trying to save life. Okay? Now, let's look at antidotes for pesticide poisoning. Remember that I'm talking about one of the specific risks or hazards that we work with. Okay, antidotes for pesticide poisoning. Yeah, what we call antidotes are substances that counteract or counter the reaction of you know pesticide in the body. Okay, especially when such pesticide is swallowed. There are basically two types of antidotes. We have the general antidotes and we have the specific antidotes. The general antidotes, which were also known as the universal antidotes, okay? You can use it for several, um, you know, pesticide poisoning issue and all that, okay? That's why we call it universal or general antidotes. And a typical example of this universal or general antidote is the activated charcoal, okay? And then we have the specific antidotes used for specific pesticide poisoning. It is usually written on the pesticide label. Is specific for a particular pesticide. And that's why you cannot overemphasize the need for you to constantly read the pesticide label. You cannot overemphasize the need for you to read it. Because everything that you need is provided as far as that pesticide is concerned. Okay? The antidote you need for that particular, if, if it is the one that is, they will tell you it treats symptomatically. Okay? That's why. When there is a pesticide poisoning and you take the victim to the hospital, the first thing the physician or the doctor will ask you is, where is the, the, the container of the pesticide that that person uh, swallowed? Because he needs to look at that same level to know what the level specified that he should do, okay? And most of these pyrethroids, nicotinoids, all these new, 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 te new, 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 new technology-based pesticides, are usually written treat symptomatically. Okay, if there is the one that has specific antidote, you can write it in it. Okay. Let me. Um, when we talk about the specific antidote, I will start with specific antidote for organophosphates. Okay, sorry for the chlorine. You have something like it. Some of us know it. We have something like a kilobarbital. Some of us know it. For organophosphate, you have something like a thin and two palm. That is this thing that we call the two palm. Okay, that is a pradidotan. Okay, that is a pradidine methyl chloride. Okay, 
we shot one day and we call it the two pan. Okay, we usually use for the reinforcement antidote. Okay, for permits, you can also use that two pan. For pyrethroids, like I said, no specific antidotes. Some of them will specify that you should treat symptomatically. That means you have to take the container, whatever it is, it's the doctor, call, call emergency care line as, as quickly as possible, and then move the person to the hospital, the nearest hospital, or the one that only registered with, and then, of course, the necessary things will be done by the doctor. If it is paracord and paracord that is activated, go comes in, that's the universal uh, antidote. Um, like in this case, when somebody um, uh, swallows paracord and all that, all these um, herbicides and all that, you don't induce deformity. And you don't do what you call gastric larry. You don't try it. Okay? If it is glyphosate, of course, you can give a different code. It will be written on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the label of that product. And then you can also give the person much water to ingest. Okay? If it is zinc phosphide and any of these anticoagulants and all that, rodenticide poisoning and all that, of course, you have to do, you have to give the person written pain. It has to be administered as quickly as possible. Because what most of these um, uh, uh, rodenticides does is that um, they inhibit the clothing of the blood, okay? So you see that the person will not be bleeding, you know, uncontrollably, okay? So administration of chemical K and vitamin K is done, you know, to, you know, enhance the clotting of the blood, okay? So this is just uh, some of the things I've mentioned that is part in our first aid box. And then let me say something. Sometimes when we go for inspection in some of these companies and other, and I say, I want to see your first aid box. They bring you, you see paracetamol, you see, if I do, rishi, rishi. And sometimes I begin to ask, okay, if there is an issue of pesticide um, poisoning now, somebody, so what will you give the, the person with this box that is here? And so they will start laughing and all that, okay? So it's high time we begin to know the necessary things that we should put in, our that was okay? Like, I always talk to you, you know, that when the is okay, as this antibiotic works in various ways. Some work neutralize the poison, some work render the poison insoluble, some work absorb the poison, while some work to coat the stomach, okay? So it says, like, some of them that neutralize the poison, okay, like, 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 and all that, okay? And that one works against acid. You look for those things and don't go, don't go over syllabus, don't go beyond the limit. Okay, then those ones that render the poison insoluble and make the harmless, some sort of does that very, very well, especially when it is done against lead or some of these heavy metals. Okay, and then some that absorb the poison in the body that is the goal, that is, that is the, the primary work of activated food. Okay, and that's what it does. And then so those ones that that is, you know, is not to put the stomach so that it, it will form a kind of lining, you know, around the wall of the villa. That swallowed will not be absorbed into the, you know, the, the, the body system. You have something like olive oil. Make sure you always have olive oil in that your first aid box, okay? Have a tin of milk in your first aid box. If possible, have, um, in fact, um, um, mustard seed is very, very important too. Okay, so these are some of the things that you get. Red oil, you can put the red oil in small container and put it in your first aid box. So, in case of anything, I'm not asking you to do over syllables. Don't do over syllables. If you don't know what to do, please, of course, when such, when, 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 when there is an issue, quickly, the first thing you do is to do what is to call for medical attention why you do the small, small things that you need to. But most importantly, somebody in your team needs to be trained on first aid and first aid issues. Okay, now in conclusion, I want to conclude by giving you a story. I'm so sorry I'm taking your time. I'm very, very sorry, but I can't go without telling this story. Because this story, anytime it used to touch my heart. I have this very wonderful colleague he worked in one of the local governments here in Lagos. And <laughs> unfortunately, you know, he was doing this pest control, whatever, operation and all that. 
but he never cared, just like what many of us do. He never cared to get a good PPE for himself and whoever that works with him, okay? He believed that he can just, ah, oh, what, is it not pesticide? Ah, oh, is it not this? You know, some of us have become so, so, you know, so used to pesticide that he, he, we don't see it as anything, we see it as water. And this, this thing kept on accumulating in the system for years. You know, I always tell people that three effects of pesticide in you, we have acute effects, we have chronic effects, and we have um, allergic effects. Acute, you will have it instanter, like the scratching, the hotness and all that. The chronic it lingers for years, sometimes five, 10, 15 years. And that's the ones that used to affect the respiratory system, reproductive system and all that. And that was the one that, you know, for years they have been inhaling it, the thing was piling up in the system. And you know, these poisons have, there is a level the body can, you know, tolerate. It got to a point that day, probably that day the body decided, decided to, you know, to bounce back. He had an oppression to do. Of course, as usual, he went with one attendant and, you know, as usual, just put the rubbish that he normally uses, including his nose and mixed pesticide and started work. As he was walking, he started feeling somehow, he started feeling busy. Instead of him to quickly bring down the machine and leave that place. And let me remind us, please, I'm already rounding up, please. Anytime you are, you are walking and you start feeling dizzy, leave that place at a moment. He did not leave that place. He was trying to finish the work, trying to hold his breath to finish the work. The next thing, the guy fell with the sprayer. Thank God the attendant was close by, helped in removing the sprayer, started calling for help. But the unfortunate thing is that before they could get to the hospital, he died on the way. Now, what am I trying to say? Safety is the foundation upon which any great business is built. We must ensure that our health, the health of our employee, our clients, our assets, our reputation, and the environment is generally safe, put in safe condition while we are carrying out our oppression so that when you finish that oppression and make the money, you'll be able to live to enjoy the benefits of your work. I say thank you and God bless you. Wow. 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 It's good to hear. Hello. What a session. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Can we all on a mic? Mic on a video. Open a video. I just appreciate. I just appreciate this lecture. I just. I just. Chamber. Chamber. So inspiring. Wow. Say thank you. Say thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. We. Thank you so very much. Can you ask for a question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. This presentation to Mrs. Ogara. My question goes thus. Does persistent lead to chronic disease in the health of the applicator when practicing? Hello? Hello? Sanitary uh, Ogara, the question Hello, is, can you hear me? does persistent lead to, yes, we can hear you, chronic disease. Okay. That's, that's one question. In the health uh, of the applicator when, when practicing. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, is there any other question? Can I just take one more person so that she can take it together and we can introduce the next facilitator, which is the last for today? Any other question? Okay, Scientific Bureau. Okay, okay, choose. Mr. So choose will suppress both. I want to ask a question quickly so that she can take the two questions together. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add one or two, just uh, quickly. You know, this uh, stuff that she dished out to us this afternoon, a lot of us don't know the um, usefulness. But the thing is, uh, we shouldn't allow experience to be our teacher when it comes to health and safety. Um, on the field, that uh, compression sprayer, you know how heavy it is? It has cost, cost a very great deal. At one point, one of our workers carrying it on his shoulder used it to knock down a very expensive vase in a rich man's house. All right. So that experience made us now uh, work uh, out something to be carrying it with us. We, we, we uh, forged a carrier for it and all that. So, what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't wait until events happen to teach us what to do in the when it comes to safety, when it comes to health. Thank you. Thank you so very much, bro. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's go to the question. Now, Sainte Obira, the question asked earlier about uh, those chemicals, can they cause any real disease or something in the body? So that we can round up the session now. Hello, ma'am. Are you there? I'll meet yourself so that you can. Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. So Very I well. said that, of course, that those pesticides that we use to work or we are using in our day to day operation can cause very serious health issues on the operators at the long run. Okay? There are cases of um, long time chronic health. Um, diseases that have risen as a result of exposure, long-term exposure to pesticide. You have reproductive impairments, you have um, respiratory issues, you have um, a whole lot, tumor, cancer. Like, you, of course, you know that some of this pesticide that is in the market that um, they will tell you, if you Google the MSDS and all that, they will tell you that this pesticide and results of cancer. I have seen it. I have read it. And that's why I'm still emphasizing. Always adhere to um, level and always go for the legs hazardous. Do you understand? You know, when, when I was talking about the, um, um, the analysis of risk, analyzing your risk and looking for means to reduce the risk, to mitigate it, I brought up a hierarchy of control, okay? If there's possibility of you to take away the risk, the hazard, do it. If you cannot take away the hazard, re replace. Do you understand? Substitution. Go for a less toxic pesticide. And you will still get the results. The problem we have is that, and the problem that the Nigerian environment have is that they want to kill everything, including themselves. I used to tell them, I said, I'm not a killer. I'm here to control pests and I will control. I'm not killing. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to kill him. No, but it's true. They want, I don't want to see any bed bug. I don't want to see any cockroach. Why won't you see? They're living things. If you, if, if, if they go out of the niche, will you take their niche? It will keep seeing. So that's why control, that's what we, that's why we advocate for control. If you are looking for eradication, you also eradicate the man that's giving you the job. That's the truth. So we have to know that there is illness associated with long use, long exposure to pesticide. Not that you will not do your job. And that's why this, this, this discussion is very, very important. So that you put down measures to mitigate the impact of that that pesticide will have. And that's where PPE comes in. You must make sure you go, you have your complete and good functional PPE. Don't go and use those masks to close nose. You are taking in all these fumes and it's accumulating in your respiratory system. It will get to a point one day, long term exposure. The body will bounce back, and what will happen? The person will collapse, like the story I told you. And that man is gone and gone for good. The drugs he was doing, there is there no people that are doing it? He died. He wasted his life. 
Or some others are doing the job. So don't think that if you die that somebody will not do the job. Somebody will do the job. So thank you so very much. Okay. Like I said, don't go and die on the work. <laughs> Amazing time though. Okay. Um, okay. We're going to move to the next class now, but I think there's somebody that has that. What are, what are the materials that are meant to be in a, in a first aid bus? You know, uh, I don't know. Scientific Bureau there, can you see kindly answer that so that we can be sure that uh, uh, all the material that's supposed to be, the standard basic material that is supposed to be in a bed bus, the first aid. You know, first aid now, you should have your paracetamol anyway. You should have your bandage. You should have your scissors. You should have some, um, the basic first aid thing. Everything, if you go to a pharmacy, you're going to say you are buying a first aid equipped. Then the thing that I feel you should have in your first aid is something like olive oil. You know, sometimes when paritroid begin to pepper your face, you need, after you have washed, you need an olive oil. In your first aid to you, or your box, you need you need soap. Always in your operation vehicle or in your bag, you must always have soap, a mild soap, not homo, not not detergent. That you can use in uh, at least uh, wash your hand regular uh, and wash off chemicals and everything. But I think one important thing that everybody should have as part of their uh, first aid equipment is something like olive oil, something like oil or or shea butter, so that when 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 there is this uh, when you begin to feel the tingling sensation of a uh, pyrethroid, no matter how much you wash, it will be there. You need something like oil based solutions to get that out. Okay, once again, I want to say a big thank you to the indefatigable, the extraordinary, the amazing, the amazing uh, sanitary and Obura. Thank you for bringing in the hay game. What a session we had. So grateful for coming. Thank you, even with all the busy schedule, you're able to pull in, pull in the time and the robust curriculum. It's been a great day, but now we're gonna go for to the last module for today. One key part of our work is equipment, machines. And do you know what? One area that many of you also have issues with is how to maintain our equipment. It's not even about having equipment. What are the basic measures on how you can make your equipment last long? How do you maintain them? Even that, even equipment like even like normal hand pump or hand sprayer, how do you maintain them? How do you ensure that the shelf life that the my machine is made for it fulfilled it? A thermal fungus should last as much as almost ten years, fifteen years, twenty years. But some form of thermal fungus can back out within six months. It has to do with the mode of use, how, do you, how are you using them? How are you maintaining them? You know, some people buy, you, you have, and it's not usually about us sometimes, some of the guys that work with us, then we need to, that's why we bring in this model so that we can be refreshed. We can know the, like the first aid, first aid measures in equipment maintenance. And uh, so I'm gonna be calling my dear friend, I hope he's inside. Engineer Tokumbo Mabinori, is it there? I hope he has not logged out. Engineer Tokumbo is a is an engineer, is a first uh, first machine expert with uh, proven track record in machine repairs and maintenance in Lagos. Here, his place at Pan Group. There, he's going to be taking us briefly on the procedures of machine maintenance. Tokumbo. You can on your mic, and you know you need to on your video because we need your video so that you can show us some of those maintenance procedures. At this time, we love everybody to put up their video so that there will be much of interaction. Why we, why we have uh, Tokumbo. Tokumbo, welcome. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see good you. Afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone in the house. Good afternoon. My name is yeah. My name my name is Olatunbo Mabinori. 
a mental equipment maintenance. I repair any kinds of fumigation machine. And um, our basic for today is how to maintain our equipment for it to be last full for us. Because the way our machine has been produced these days, not in Nigeria, I said from, from Korea, even the Germans machines, some are not produced very strongly like the way they had before. Like the way they had before. So that's the reason why we have to apply our wisdom. And we should apply care to it as well. Because all these machines, we need to take them as if we are taking our brother or our younger ones, so on, something dear to us. If we are neglecting them the way we neglect our pets, we are going to kill our pets. Definitely, we are going to kill our machine like that as well. Within just for one exercise. Machine maintenance is very, very simple. It's all about you yourself having the culture in you, how you are to use your machine, and after the use, how you are to maintain it before you go, before it's good for servicing. And one thing I will tell you people is that you can't wait for machine to pack off before you can say, okay, let me go for servicing. That's not servicing. There's difference between servicing and repair. Anything you have to repair has been spoiled. Anything you have to service is something that is due for it. So we won't wait for when our machine or any of our equipment is spoiled before we now say, ah, definitely we have to take it for servicing. No, that's not servicing. So don't let us miss the English shop. It's a different ball game. And it's a different thing entirely. Firstly, any day we use anything called this time I forgot. It might be this, it might be this, it might be any type, it might be of this type. And there are some that I have that are not here. If you are using your thermal forger, you put in your chemical in it, your solution and every other thing in it. And you use it, no matter how, how you exhaust the whole tank, there will still be a leakage. There will still be, sorry, there will still be a, a little chemical remaining in the pipe. And if this chemical in the pipe does not flush out, definitely it will cause a blockage here. Because after you stop the machine, there will be kind of a heat in the exhaust inside. There is exhaust inside it that is blowing out the smoke, that is converting the chemical to smoke. There will be a heat here. And that heat will be burning the little drop of each, each solution here to become carbon. And that carbon will become thick that it will block it gradually, 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 gradually. So my advice is, whenever you use your machine, your thermal fogger, whether mini fogger, whether this thermal fogger, you are to force of force empty. That's why this part is created here. Yeah. If this part is not in your machine, definitely where you pour in your solution, you can easily pour it out carefully for this solution not to go through this side. Because if the solution go back through this side, if it will definitely go into the carburetor or go back into the petrol. And once it goes back into the petrol, it can easily spoil the machine. So you have to be careful about that. The way you are pouring it out, you have to be mindful of it. You have to make sure this side goes up very well for it to come out of here when you are pouring it. 
So once they pour it out, you pour water in it, you rinse it, you pour it out again. You can pour water in it in, in, in the second time. You can pour water in it second time, and you try to cover it up. You cover it up and start the machine. You start the machine for the solution in the pipe to flush out. Just a little water, just to flush it out. And once it's flushed out, then you can keep it aside. You can keep it aside and pour away the remaining water in the tank. But I will still say something. If you are not a, a kind of a person that work regularly with your equipment, don't use water. Because water might later on rust the tank. Don't use water. But try possible best that you can to remove all the chemical in it. You remove all the chemical in it and open it to here. Open it, don't cover it. Because if you don't open it, definitely the residual and the power of the chemical will go through in and start spoiling all the holes here. To spoil it here and here, it will spoil them. That means you might have challenge at the long run there as well. So the ones here, as something that you can easily open here and try to maneuver, maneuver the way it turns like this to make it turns out. Do you understand? So I keep it aside. And anytime you notice that your machine, machine is trying to like giving you a kind of different sign from the way it was giving you before, definitely, definitely you have to Definitely, you have to take it out for servicing. And, I, and so people normally raise a question for me that how long does a service period take? Even if it's a car, you can run a car in a day, in a day, and it will do for servicing that very day. Depend on that, depend on the long miles that you covered. So according to the machine, According to what he said about the machine before you can service it, it has a stipulated hours. It has a stipulated hours that you have to use it for before you use for servicing. What is about one and something hours? One hundred and something hours, I think so. And calculating the hours is not up to a month or so. Uh, sorry, it's not up to a month plus. Let's say a month plus or so. I can't really remember the hours now, but it's not up to a month. In our own case here, due to our own mentality, I normally tell people and I advise people that okay, let's make it, let's make it a year, a three months, a three month uh, servicing thing. Let's make it a three month servicing thing. So after three months, you, you, you run the service again. So don't let us all wait for a machine to walk down before you can say, okay, you want to go for service. That's no more service, it's a repair. And there's another machine here as well called the NAMSA, which I know that we all are very, very used to. We are all very, very used to this. This is a machine that you can use with water. You can use it with kerosene. Likely you can use it with diesel. Depends on the work you want to use it for. How to maintain this machine for it to last long? If I should tell you that this machine has been with me for good more than eight to ten years now, no one will believe it. It's due to the way I maintained it. It's due to the way I maintained it. This is my own personal machine. And I do rent it out. Let me see. I do rent it out. Or easily. Try to check inside of it. I will make sure that the water inside of it will be white, like pure, like normal water. You can see the water in it is white. It's white water. It's a normal water. So I will make sure it's clean very well before I can cover it back. Or at times, if I should see that I'm feeling the kind of 
a chemical substance or chemical smell in it, I open it out for the smell to go. If possible, someone is there to smell it, you will see that it's not smelling anything of a chemical. For the chemical odor at times have effect on the rubbers or the holes of the trigger. And all these things spoils the holes with few, few, few days. In few days, it spoils the holes. So you have to be cleaning it each time used. You have to clean it no matter how, 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 how the solution you use, whether it's kerosene, even if it is kerosene, you have to use soap, a detergent to wash it. If it's a, if it's a kerosene you use or any other thing aside water, definitely you have, a, you have to use a detergent to wash it thoroughly. You can wash it about two, three times with your detergent or it will last for you. But if it is something that is water-based, definitely you, have, you can use ordinary water to wash it. And once you put water in it, you rinse it, you gargle it, you pour it away, put another water in it, you gargle it, you pour it away. The third one, you just put it in it and you try to pump it out, like you are spraying. You pump it out, like you are spraying. You just pump everything out. Once you pump it out, like that, the whole water in it, you pump it out. The first two water, uh, water that you wash out, is just for the interior to be clean. So the last water putting in it is just to wash the hose here. This hose that is bringing out the chemical from the plunger is just to clean it up. So for it to be clean, so there won't be any chemical left in it. Was any chemical left in it will turn the hose to be sieved. This is the hose that came with this machine. This is the hose that came with it and is not sieved. Is this stuff like a normal hose? Is this stuff stuff like a normal hose? If, it's a, if, if it is, if it is, if it is something that I don't really maintain, that means there will be. There, it, that means the hose will be very stiff, very strong. The chemical will strengthen the hose. So that is just it. That's right. That's it. So my my advice for this is mostly once you are using it and it's normally clean, you have the problem. You have the problem of the trigger. Because those people that complain about this machine, they complain about this trigger because it's normally broke out. Normally broke out. So one message to blot out is the chemical left in it. So that's just it. And there's, a, there's also something that I want to say about uh, the mini fogger. I, I have a lot of people that have been calling me for the mini fogger issue about the rings and all that. I think uh, what I used to do the ring is now available. For a while now, I, I, I hardly get the material for the ring, but now it's available. It's available now. And no matter how it is, when you are using the mini fogger as well, you have to be cleaning it, no matter how it is. Cleanliness is most important thing in our all our equipment. Cleanliness is the most important thing in it. Cleanliness is the most important thing. And when you are cleaning, don't off your mask. Let your mask still be with you. Because no matter how it is, chemical is everywhere. Why is chemical? It's always the chemical. So I would like if anyone has any question, and that's what I can take for now. So maybe I can answer question from there. Thank you, Engineer Tokumbo. Thank you for this session. Yeah. <laughs> Riven up and um... Okay, let's quickly take a question from the house. The, the pest control engineer is here. All of us, we always have issues with, uh, with equipment here and there. So please ask him those basic knowledge. You may not know those basic knowledge about your equipment. Let's just get like two, three questions quickly so that we can move to. Oh, oh Blood James, can you ask a question quickly? I want to ask a question. No, I want to ask a question. yourself. Oh, Blood James, omit yourself and ask a question. 
Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, engineer, uh, I appreciate the time and your uh, education. Uh, please, I want to ask something. This um, this jack to the sprayer. That's this the is it the, is it called the chamber? That's uh, aluminium. This thing. The aluminium and, at the base. Yeah. It's called the chamber. It has, it has a pressure rubber inside. Yes, a black one. That pre- yeah, that pressure rubber. In a situation where that pressure rubber has has faults, can it be replaced? Yes, it can be replaced. Okay, is it something we can do on our own, or we have to take it to uh, somebody like you that repairs? Uh, actually, it's something that you can do on your own. Is it? Okay. The way you can do it on your own is the way you lose it out. Let it be the way you are to put it back. Yes, sir. So don't let any, don't let anything additional to be in, involved when you're replacing it. When you don't put anything additional in it, when you are removing it. So don't let any addition thing to be in it. And the kind of machine you are talking about is it a a, a jacto sprayer or yeah, all this other sprayer? No, it's jacto. It's jacto. That means it has a thirteen bolt on there, one thirteen bolt or two thirteen bo- or two ten bolts. The original jack, I don't know. I don't know uh, how no, many. No, no, there is one that has one one thirteen bolt, and there is one that has two ten bolts. The one that has two ten bolts is the one of sixteen liter, and the one no. that has one 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 one, one bolt is the one of twenty liter. No, this one is twenty liter. And that means it has one boot. Exactly, exactly, the, exactly the one you use for your practical. This one you exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 it. That's a twenty liter. Okay. Yeah. That's twenty liter. So, so uh, yeah. it's, it's at, it, there's a ball in it, and that ball is the is is the, is, is what controls the pressure. If that ball is not there, there won't be any pressure. It won't suck any water. Okay, sir. So whenever you are losing it, once you lose it out, you bring out the chamber. You bring out the uh, the the plunger first. Okay. Then you okay. go to the chamber. You try to lose the tartan under. Once you lose the tartan under, you bring out the chamber. Once you bring out the chamber, then you will now use something to eat that rod. With you put a boat. You okay. bo- you put a boat at the base. Okay, sir. You put a boat at the base. Of the chamber, the boat that you lose, you put it there for you to eat the boat inside. So the black thing will now move inside, inside till it gets out. Okay, sir. Do you understand? So once it gets out, you can easily find something to open the top. Once you open the top, that's when you can get access the ball. Oh, okay. Or if the ball is not there, definitely you can put the ball there and put it back. If the rubber surround the black something that I'm saying yeah. is not there, don't don't be don't be worried. You can easily put it back. Okay. You can still put it back. What matters okay. most is the is the base rubber. We won't okay. be able to see the rubber very well, but it's a is a, is a tiny rubber that is is under it and it has been with the plastic. The rubber is uh, is, is somehow I. Um... Uh, cream color, eh? Right? Yes. Yeah. It always comes with spare because this machine I actually bought it last year. It has a spare, but I discovered that it's for. It, but this machine is still working, though, right? Just yeah. discover. Okay, no yeah. problems. I will kind of chat always, to always later. try to always try to ensure that you normally clean it very well after sure, using. I, sure, we do that always. We and do once that. you clean, once you clean like that, don't cover it all back. Because the sure, heat of that, the chemical at times affects the the, the 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 ball we are talking of, we are complaining of now. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So always open it down. Okay, sir. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I think you see, I picked that now. When you when we wash, wash, don't cover the tank back. Don't that's, cover it back uh, because there will be a yeah, heat. Uh, and that is what. But back to the bad moths. Can you unmute yourself and quickly ask a question? Afterwards, we are going to take a debola and we will. Yeah. Good time. afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. My question is: Everything we have said about it, I've tried it, but I, 
I come to know that I used a powder fumigant, but I also control um, weed somewhere. So I had to get um, a trazine. So it's a powder fumigant, which after using it, I clean up. Then the next time to use it, I found out that there's a blockage. The powder keep coming out. Sometimes into the nozzles, everywhere. After some time again, after like a week, I clean it again. The powder keep coming out. But I found out that the rubber blocks. I had to change the rubber. But all the time, it's still difficult to pump out. Hello? Yeah, I'm yeah, with okay. you. Yeah, thank you. We got that message. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. I really get your message, but I don't really get it clear. Because there's something pumping in, like a kind of strange noise like that. It's like okay. you said, uh, uh, you have a block. In you. What, what is the type of the machine you are really talking of? I don't know. The knapsack. The same that knapsack. same knapsack that I show you. Not this. Is the 16 liter on? This is still liter on. But it's not the iron type you are, you are using. It's the plastic. The pump is plastic. The black plastic. Okay, is the iron, is the, is the iron knapsack, Abi? Is the plastic. No, 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 no. The rubber one. But the, the pump rubber. is the black pump. Okay. Not this metal pump you have here. Okay, 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 okay. So into uh, this, I know there is a Boris. I opened everything. There is a Boris. There is everything. I cleaned it up. Even all the whole pipe, I cleaned it up. But I still found out that no week, no time I want to use it. There is a blockage. Even it's difficult to even pump out. Sometimes we breathe with pressure. At some time we block again. Sorry, what are you using with it? What are you using with it? No, I used it for in a customer place. Then the, no, 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 use, no, uh, no, no. Get my message. What are you using with it? As in, what's the solution you are using? Is it water. a water-based solution? Water, the chemical water, water. Is, the chemi is water. The chemical I used with it that caused this thing was a powder one, which I wait, wait, wait. You are the cause of the problem. This, this that's the reason why this uh, platform uh, is, is all about for us to educate ourselves. There is a proper machine for a powder machine. They call it mist blower. It blows powder. Do you understand? You can't use I knapsack. Understand. You can't use knapsack for a powder. You, 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 you pour the powder in the water, right? Yes. It yes. won't turn to a solution. It won't. Because the powder will cause a blockage at the long run. Even at the process, it will cause a blockage because the powder will not will, will not miss to a final solution. You understand? I understand. It will miss to a final solution. There is one, the mist blower I'm talking of, it looks like a motorizer. I know it, I know it. You pour the powder in it. It has a tank. You pour the powder in it, the powder you have to use, you pour it in it, and you carry it at your back. Then you start blowing. It will blow the powder. It will blow it out like a powder. Do you understand? No, but you can't use a you can't use a powder in a motorizer in a sprayer, or a, yeah. you can use it in a motorizer because the motorizer has a big nozzle. But you can't use it in a sprayer. A sprayer will block because sprayer comes with nets, nets to stop all these substances not to work. You see, there is something that you have to lose there that you've not lose, which is called the trigger. If you lose the trigger head, if you lose the trigger head, can you hold on for me for just two minutes? Let me just bring the trigger for you because I'm trying to okay. charge my phone in the office now. Because my phone is down. Let me I put, know let the me trigger. There's a, there's, there's a head on it. Okay. You have to lose the head, uh, right? Once you lose the head, check it. If the hose is not that big, if the if the rubber in it is big, you have to cut it. You trim it out. You trim it as a like, run like the normal of the metal in it. You put that one back. You cover it back. And you now open the nozzle. The nozzle is the, is the, is the mouth. The nozzle is the mouth. The nozzle is the mouth. You okay. open the mouth as well because if the powder escape the trigger, definitely it will go. To, to the nozzle. Once you get to the nozzle, that's yes, the sir. final point he has to release out. I have Releasing done all the cleaning of those ones. You have to 
you have to lose the nozzle as well. Once you lose the nozzle, try to clean it. The nozzle is the tip of the no of, of the of the of the lance. That that straight that straight iron. Yes, sir. Lose it. Lose the tip, the, the head of it. Lose it. Once you lose it, try to clean it up, put it back. It will definitely spray. But don't but use this, the powder. If Inside you want to, the, if you want to, if you want to force yourself to use the powder, yeah. what I will advise you to do, put a water down in a small plastic. Yeah. Pour your powder in it. Miss it yeah, as sir. if you are missing your ogi before you prepare it. Yeah, Once yeah. you miss it very well, you now put a net, a net on. on Engineer Tokumbo, are you there? Um, sir, the fortune, can I say something concerning this man's yes. crystal? Yes, okay. Um, um, I, you know, what he used was a suspension concentrate with a, with a manual sprayer. And we know uh, this suspension uh, concentrate, they have these uh, particles, like the active ingredients are kind of particles. So even when they are mixed with water, those particles will still be there because they are what emit and drop and uh, kind of their effect is always retained, especially when you carry out residual spray. So these particles are always retained like a kind of residual they have this residual effect. I, I had the, the same experience with uh, this, my jack too. Luckily, the day I went, we went to do the job, we took along our uh, motorized and this jack to manual sprayer. So when we missed, we, we missed, I uh, used uh, that day, we used a uh, alpha uh, side net. So when we mixed on the locals, on the jack tool, the jack tool, after like five minutes spray stopped, it was as if the whole thing blocked. Yeah. And we were like, what could be the cause? What could be the cause? And that was the first time I used a suspension concentrate. So I was like, what could be the cause? What could be the cause? So we just turned the whole solution into the motorized and it was fine. The motorized spray well, very well. I never seen knew that these chemicals contain particles. Not until we got home, I rinsed, I washed the motorized, we washed the motorized rather, clean it up, then we kept it, I left it open for uh, till the next day. Going to check on it the next day, I discovered I was seeing whitish particles, like dusty white, uh, whitish particles. So when uh, I, I, that was when I now said, okay, let me go and check, read, through that uh, container of that uh, chemical again. And that's kind of, um, I got to understand that, hey, this chemical actually had particles. So the, the, the trigger of this, um, uh, this manual sprayer is, it's, I, I believe it uh, only accepts uh, the uh, fine droplet as in this, um, it's only does not accept, um, those particles. And that is why that machine had issue. You know, when this thing is agitated, these chemicals, they, they, they fit in the chamber, which is like the one he's talking, that white uh, chamber inside the machine. These chemicals, they gather there. So those emits that is coming from that machine, I believe is what has residue, is a, the residue of that particle in that white chamber. I don't know if you're understanding me. The, uh, yeah, yeah, the white, the, this particle has kind of residue, uh, settled, or rather settled on the white chamber. So that is, I believe that is the, the reason why he's 
they having uh, any uh, that reoccurrence of uh, those particles coming out. So, like what I uh, draw the conclusion I drew out from my own experience is that I don't have to use that uh, such uh, uh, all this suspension uh, concentrate with a manual sprayer. So that is mm -hmm. just my Thank own you. idea. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, James. So that that's quite insightful. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I think uh, Tokumba was having issue with networks. I think it's been oh, it's been an awesome day. And that's just basic. Some of you have been asking questions about the phone numbers of the facilitator. All of you are on the WhatsApp group. The facilitators are also on the WhatsApp group. So, so they will be there to answer your question. We just private chat me in most cases. We can get their details available for you. Okay. Before we round up today, there are certain people I really want to be recognized on this on this meeting today. We have a real privilege, friends and colleagues. We have a very real privilege to have one very mighty person join us on this in this meeting. And I cannot just close this meeting without celebrating him and appreciating the fact that he could make it to this meeting. The Pekka National President, PC Okunle Williams, is on this call. Can we can we just Say welcome. Can you just, you just give him, just turn your mind and welcome the national Welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. Welcome, I have muted everybody now. President, sir, we love you to talk to us and we love to hear from you. And maybe anybody has any question they can ask from you directly because I've always been bombarded with questions of Pekan, questions of, especially as regard this summit that we're having with Eurocon. I have so many questions and in this, and also I also want to recognize the personality of Rotimas. So look thank you for being in this call today. Thank you for, thank you for honoring our invitation. Okay. It's a real pleasure so, to have you. President, sir. Yes, my um, day, Thank you very much and well done. And good afternoon all. Hope we're all doing well. And um, this is a very great um, program I've been. I, I came in a bit late, but uh, you know, we learn every day. We learn every day. There's no expert. The day you, you're an expert and you don't want to learn anymore, then that means you have retired or you have, um, you have, you have gone up to meet your maker. So we learn every day and um, it's quite a, exciting and interesting, especially on the maintenance of equipment, which is very important. Uh, Mayor De is the National Assistant General Secretary. He's one of our most um, vibrant, you know, um, member of executive. And um, I, I give kudos to him for most of these programs that he's doing, and it's, it's catching up. I want to believe that um, all of us on this program are, are practitioners and we're practicing the proper way. And of course, you know, the proper way is to belong to a recognized body, which of course, you know, is Pest Control Association of Nigeria, which um, would um, help those of you that haven't had your Eurocon registration um, to, you must be a Eurocon certified to practice in the country. So it's always good for us to be on the side of the law because you never know when the law will catch up with you. So I'm using this forum and the opportunity to ask those of you that have not joined PECAN to quickly um, get your acts together and um, and come and join us uh, because very soon we're going to close the doors because uh, we found out that a lot of uh, quacks are in this profession and we're working with government. We're partnering with government to make sure that not just anybody, you know, you must be guaranteed by the professional association and the professional association uh, would not tolerate having quacks you know, around. So once again, I want to thank um, the organizers of this and most of the uh, resource people. I missed some of them. I'm sure that Ayodeji will give me, I'm sure we'll be able to get uh, the video of this. And um, I, I know he'll be expecting me to pay some money, you know, so <laughs> I, I can rest assured you that I will, because I, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to use it to, to retain my own staff too. So, and we need to pay something. You can't, um, you need to give something to get something. So thank you very much. We'll revert back to you. And on the summit, it is very important. This summit is very important. I'm sure that um, uh, the 14 has spoken about it. Um, it's coming up next week. It is very compulsory for any practitioner in this country 
um, it is being organized by the regulator. That's the only regulator in Nigeria, which is um, I will recall, Environmental Health Officers Action Council. Um, PECAN is also a stakeholder and other um, stakeholders in cleaning waste disposal. But when we're talking about pest management, you have to register. It's, this would help you in becoming finally certified. This is going to be one of the conditions that will be looked at for them to consider you for membership. And when you have issues with local government, these are some of the things that can also help you out. You know, to see that you have attended programs organized by the number one regulatory body in the country. So I would um, advise you that no matter how tight it is, this is very necessary to your practice in this country. And please take up the opportunity, register, and if you can't be in Abuja, please join virtually. And I think it's just about 20,000 naira or so. And um, I can tell you that will go a very long way in making you um, a force to be reckoned with in the practice. And um, we, we in Pekan would also, it would be one of the few things that will look at your membership that will make it easier for you to become a member because that shows that you have been attending trainings and um, you also have some certifications from um, our main regulator. So once again, I know time has been well spent, I believe, and a lot of us have learned so much. And um, I want to use this opportunity to say thank you and um, keep up the good work of the fortune and partners, and may God bless us all. Opekan. Amen. Health is Opekan. wealth. Opekan. Opekan. Health, health, health is wealth. Is wealth. So health thank you very wealth. much. Have thank a wonderful you, esteemed day. President. God bless you. Thank you so very much, sir, for the huge honor, honor to be with us this evening. What a great privilege. And you see, to every one of you, you already have an advantage. You want to join PECA and say, I attended that meeting. President, you addressed us. So you say that's one of the key advantages. And I really, I really want you to take advantage of it. Maybe I should just open the mic, allow somebody to say something, maybe in respect to the summit or a PECA membership, because I always get all these uh, inquiries, inquiries. I have to attend to so many people about different matters. But if you know you have any pressing question now, president is here, can you just ask it now? Can you allow me to, you want to ask the question and make it brief. Don't let us yeah, make yeah, it brief. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good afternoon okay. once again, everyone. Um, so I want, to, I want to ask as regards joining um, PECA or any of these, any of these um, bodies, because I'm new to the I'm new to the pest management industry, and um, as a matter of fact, I've tried to I've tried to do my research in the past to see if there was any functioning body, and when I saw this platform, I was very happy, and I just had to jump on it. I've been in the cleaning industry for a while, and I've seen that the cleaning industry doesn't even have um, like a recognized body per se. So I want to know if the steps to go through in joining PECAN as a body and other um, pest management bodies. That's just it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kaode. Okay, let me take another question from Badmos. Baba Tunde, so that President can take the two together. Baba Tunde, Badmos. Are you there? Okay, I need to welcome Buki Shule. Good to see you, yeah. Buki Zappas. I'm there. Hello. I know tomorrow will be loaded. Okay, Baba Tunde is there. Before, Baba, before Bukishole, yeah. please, let me quickly get Baba Tunde bad news. Hello. Okay, so Baba Tunde. I, I studied the PECAM list. But what I found out is that they said you should have a location, office, and all this, and, and capacity and cash or finance for those that don't have offices. Can they still be a member? People that work from home. To answer your question straight away, he is a business for professionals. First and foremost, you need to have a space where you are operating from. You cannot be operating chemicals from your bedroom. We know. You will not be, you will not be approved for that. Because chemical, chemical application is about safety. We did a course just now before now about health and safety. Yes. You cannot be putting chemicals in the same apartment you are staying. So Peckham frown at that street. is a street. Peckham is very strict in that regard. 
it's not it's not the location of your office or how fancy it is it doesn't it could even be a container shop but a separate location where you are operating from not your bedroom not your kitchen okay. i think that that is clear enough book is your layer please okay good afternoon everybody Mr. President, Absolutely. thank you for everything you've done to move the course of PECAN forward in Nigeria. We really appreciate you. My question has to do with the Eurocon um, summit coming up next week. So for those of us who are already registered with Eurocon, and all we do is just renew our annual permit on an annual basis, do we still have to, are we being inducted? Is everybody being inducted? I think it's a little bit confusing for me. And then do we have to still pay for our Eurocon consultant to attend the conference? That's the second question. Then the third question, if this consultant is a consultant to many companies, how will this work out? So three questions, we're already registered with Eurocon and all we do is just to renew our annual permit. So do we, have to still, do we have to pay for our consultant to attend with us? And if this consultant is a consultant to many other companies, how will this work? That's my question for Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Okay, I'm going to mute everybody now so that the president can come in and answer those few questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, Shola, you should be the one answering these questions. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, which questions? Uh, okay, 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 Shola, you should be the one. She's a ranking member of Pekan. Uh, um, and well, but for the, for the benefit of others, I'm sure that question she had to ask because um, a lot of people would uh, need to know, especially because of the summit that is coming up. First of all, um, you can only be inducted once. So you must have been inducted. The inductees are people that haven't been inducted over the years because of uh, one issue or the other. And those that went were not because there wasn't any induction last year. So all the, uh, you know, the new entrants from last year to this year would be um, inducted. Now on the question about you going with your consultant, I think only the inductees are required to go with their um with the come with the um, consultants, not um, um, the members that have already been inducted over time and are just renewing. But it is compulsory for everybody. I mean the attendance. Either you are an inductee, either you are um, a PECAN member, either, anybody that is practicing pest control in Nigeria today. It is a compulsion, and the reason why it's a compulsion is that it's going to be like a, an added point to your um, your your uh, your being admitted to into um, to Eurocom. So let's bear that in mind. I hope that answers um, uh, Buki's um, question. That uh, we've missed her so much. She's been she's been taking care of. Um, us on the international platform, and um, I pray that uh, God brings her back safely to join us. She's been, and she's been doing a lot um, virtually too, and we're enjoying all that. So we'll keep it up, uh, Madam, and God will continue to bless you. So thank you, sir. <clears throat> yes, sir. All the other thank, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, the other question was um, was um, something to do with um, how to join PECAN. Very simple. You're already in the process. You know anybody that seeks knowledge someone that wants to know and one person that would better him or himself, he or herself off now you've joined them um, you've attended this and um, and this would expose you to a lot of things like the membership of pecan um is very easy um, you get your form i think the form is um so you say, well you're with ATS yes, here he has all the information um so far you can contact him you can become a member in no time and of course one of the conditions will be show evidence of training attended and you've started this, this Huracan and some other programs would make it easier for you. And um, the other gentleman that was, um, that wanted to um, know if he needed a location. You, you need a location and you must, first of all, be registered in Nigeria to practice business, to be a member of PECAN, basically. 
So you must have your CAC registration. You must have been registered to, to do business. And you cannot register to do business if you don't have a business premises. You know, they, I don't know, maybe you get my drift. So if you have, if you have registered and you have a business um, um, premises, then it follows that uh, before we can approve your membership, we must know that you are not run, you are not operating from a from a suitcase. And that means of no fixed address, which is very dangerous, you know. So all our members should have, and then with what the AGS has said uh, before to you, your, you cannot use your home address because we're going to come and inspect you. you because of the because of your own because of your own good, you can't put chemicals. In fact, in your office, you can't just put chemicals anywhere. You must have a dedicated place. And if you don't have, we'll train you. So it's not as if it is only those that are perfect that we are, we are, um, we accept at Pekan. We also bring you up. We tell you what to do. We guide you, and we boost up your um, knowledge about this with in-house trainings and all that. And then we're like an incubation center. You know, then when we know that we've perfected you, we take you to a whole recon and present you and help to guarantee you that this person, we guarantee that that he's fit and um, able to license. So thank you very much, and I hope um, I can be released at this point yes, so that I can quickly. Thank you, President. Sir. We have issues on the summit that we're already working on. I have a meeting to get into with the register in the next 30 minutes. So thank you very much once again. And um, I hope to see all of you at the summit next week, either virtually or physically. And God bless you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, President. Sir. Thank you so thank much. You, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. So once again, for some of you that have not registered for the summit, it's for all practitioners in the industry. You may say, I don't have a record yet. I don't have a yet, but still register. A certificate will be issued for you for participating in the training. And how do you register? You go to Remita. Remita dot net that is a single treasury single account of the federal government search for environmental health officer registration council of nigeria you will see a drop down what are you paying for you will see something like mcep trade slash training click on it if you are attending physically in abuja like me i will be in abuja you are you're going to do thirty thousand naira. If you are going to attend virtually, like we're attending this meeting training virtually, your own is 20,000 naira. Click on it. Your remitter code, put your in your description, indicating that you're attending seminar for this, put your company name, then your remitter code will be generated. You can take that your code to the bank and pay across the counter, just, just quote that remitter code, or you just simply pay with your card, or just, Either way you are paying. It is, I will advise you to try and ensure you complete that process between now and tomorrow. Because the seminar starts next week. And so that your certificate could be made ready. Everybody, four years ago, when the fortune was inducted, we I was in Abuja, two certificates were issued, both a recon license and also another certificate of participation in the training was given to us. But for those that will be inducted, they will receive the certificate of Eorecon. We have so many PECA members that we have helped that they are going to be inducted next week because in PECA, like President said, it's, it's like an incubation place. You come in, we help you to, to smoothen the edges and push you in so that you can get your licenses. We just want all our members to be licensed. Then you will also get the certificate of participation in that training. That is Eorecon will get that. It's advisable because, because Eorecon has said, that certificate is a case in, is, is what we did we help in your renewal of license or fresh application so please whatever twenty thousand naira can use use it to save yourself when some of us were doing this we did not have opportunity of all this information so now that you have all this information please maximize it take advantage of it and that is my thoughts for on that matter please go to remitter and uh, or you go to a record website and uh, you get it. And if you have any product that you want to exhibit, that is one that concerns me. I have been privileged by the president of Pekan to be appointed to be in charge of exhibition for the summit. So if you want to have a, a stand for your exhibition, maybe you have some product, pest management product that is not that approved, and you want to exhibit, you want to take a table, send me a WhatsApp chat. WhatsApp chat, please. I always prefer WhatsApp chat. WhatsApp chat. 
so that if you want to take it, the, the program is holding at International Conference Center, Abuja. It, so this is the biggest environmental health program in this country. And I really want you to be a part of it. If you really know, if you really want to be the, the best of the best as you should be in this industry, and you want to differentiate yourself from the streets, from quacks, like they say, so endeavor to be part of it. And they want to be part of it. So that's that, that aside. This this is gonna be a wrap up for today. It's been an awesome time, I tell you. I've been so amazingly inspired today from the from the four uh, modules we've treated from uh, Ryan. Ryan started at 10 a.m. on the chemicals and application techniques like global best best practice, best practice in pest management and disease control. Then we move to IPM and vector control by choose what a what a blast a class a, a class and we also move to earth safety and management of risk on the feed for service providers and chemicals analysts alike by sanitary and right now what a, what a session and to engineer Tokumbo Mabinori very insightful very short class but very detailed all our facilitators we have a we have a group called pest control forum they are there where you will get to to have hands on daily continuous learning learning you know the finish for this you know then you know they finish. So don't think you know everything. Let me continue, you know? So don't just think you have been, you know, we have to keep learning. We have to keep refreshing ourselves. And I appreciate all of you for trusting us and making yourself available for this training. Tomorrow, we are going to be having four modules. You know, we're going to be having four modules. We started at early 10 a.m. The class will be open by 9.45 a.m. Come on on time. If you know you have somebody that you think you should register for this training, even though half day has gone, they can still register and be a part of it. We will make the video available for them to, to get the full. Tomorrow will be loaded. We are going to be having Bukki Shule talk to us about branding. Wow. We're going to be talking about microbial disinfection and decontamination. We are going to be talking about how to develop and improve your businesses. We are going to be talking about digital tools that you can use in improving your business in this modern age. Come on. Watch out for tomorrow. It's going to be incredible, I assure you. I'll show you. Thank you so very much. Before I go to that, before we round up, can I just hear a feedback from one or two person on how we can improve the system or just for them, maybe a compliment, maybe a, 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 you, you notice something, you want just someone to put an uh, observation, recommendation. Can we just hear something from somebody before we close this afternoon? It's three o'clock. We're supposed to close by three, but we are just three minutes. I can just spend the next two minutes. Can somebody just talk to us? Your experience so found in the past five hours. Five hours, tricks, amazing. And all of you have been there. You guys have been there. If we thought it's not possible for people to stay for five hours, you guys have been there for five hours. So, do we have anybody that wants to say something? Do you want to say something? Can you say something to us before we wrap, before we wrap up for today? Good evening. You want to say something? Nathaniel Zoya, you want to say something? Carol De you want to say something? But to the bad news, anyone that wants to say yeah, something? It's, yeah, it's, it's been... It. Hello, sir. Hello, everyone. It's It's been a, a great privilege to be here, and I must really commend the efforts of the facilitators and the organizers of, of, this, of this session. And um, I've, I've gained a lot. I've learned a lot. And like they always say, knowledge is power. And the moment you stop learning, that means the person is dead. So I'm glad that I, I was able to join this platform. Like I said, this is my first time of, of joining a platform like this to talk about what we do, to um, enlighten us on how we can get better at our crafts and how we can get better at becoming professionals. And um, yeah. Summary of it all is just thank you very much for for the platform and for the for the enlightenment. I really appreciate. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Gaudi. One more person. You want to say something? Yes. We're winding <laughs> up the window for today. One more person. Just commit yourself and say something. I've not heard a lady speak since. Can you say something? <laughs> Nobody's ready to say Yeah, can, Hello, can, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Oh, 
oh, now nah, I need to now select now. Nah. Let me just okay. This is what I'm going to do. I meet. I mean, I've muted everybody now, and I'm going to call. Who wants to speak now? Should just indicate. Let me know so that we can uh, control it. Okay, unmute your mic. Let one person just unmute and speak. Let us get you. Unmute. Hello, let's everybody. Toby Abiniza, right? Okay, let's hear you. Yes, yes I actually really enjoyed the class. The aspect of um, safety very 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 important i think something happened to my staff recently and um after the fumigation job he he, he had a slight injury from the i think there's a part of the bed they were trying to fumigate for bed bowl. so he has a slight injury on his head so immediately they had to take him to the chemist and rush him now assuming he had had an ailment to wear during the job he wouldn't have that kind of injury so actually, I think part of those PPE, the ailments, the boards, all those stuff, I'm going to put it into action. And I actually really, really enjoy the class. Thank you very much, sir. Wow. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's that's quite a light See? Very, very, very important. OK. Adebola Adeosh, you want to say something before we close? Adebola, are you there? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I thought you were a lady. I was expecting a lady to speak. <laughs> a lady. What I'm saying is that I really appreciate the opportunity that you have given love for us. At least we'll continue to use uh, our understanding concerning the industry. It's been a... Uh, in fact, there's so we want to the first privilege I give. I, and I pray that uh, the expert you are, that you are doing in this to Almighty God continue to uh, do the great to continue to go higher. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. So, no lady wants to speak to us. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you finally. Who is that person? My name is Ifama Ozonwosu. My company name is Kamikos. Okay, Kamikos. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you very much for this pro wonderful process of unlearning, relearning, and retraining. I learned a whole lot of new things. I especially enforcement. Because half of my problem is that I know many of these. And when you, you tell your staff and you are not there, they will do something completely different. But I like that they all participated in this training with me. Mm. So we all go through this process of doing the things the right way every time. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Kamiko. You see, you see the amazing part of she allowing her staff. She actually registered for two of her staff, including her making three. So she's not just getting the knowledge, trying to point it across. She invested, she has started in, she invested in it. The amount we charge for this training, we overspend more than this. It's not the money. What I was looking at is commitment. So when you part with a little, you'll be so committed to it. And I congratulate all of you for, for, for making yourself available for this. Thank you so very much. Now we're going to round up, wrap up for today so that we can prepare for tomorrow. Thank you so very much. God bless you. We love you. The fortune love you. The fortune appreciate you for trusting us to organize such a program. We're so grateful for believing in us, believing in Advert and for taking everything. Go back to the notes. Enjoy it. I want to pray before we close. We pray at we pray at close. Father, we thank you. We bless you for the opportunity to learn all that we've learned. The information we have received, the idea is that we have received, we will not only receive them, we will use them, we will act on them. And this will improve our life, improve our business, improve our processes, improve our operations, and take us to higher levels in this industry. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. My name is Ayode the Fortune of the Fortune Pest Solutions. I love you. Thank you for everything. Thank you for following me on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram, Defortune Pest Control. 
on Instagram. The Fortune Pest Control, just go there, follow. You can also follow our other, other page, pestshop.ng. You know, pest shop, you can buy anything online. Thank you for patronizing all our product as well. The Fortune Flow, Kumafin, Fumi Stret, Corona. Okay, I don't know why my edition is not in meeting. No, thank you for, for patronizing some of our amazing products. Thank you, we appreciate you. So for some of it, I'll be in Abuja. We see in Abuja on Monday. I'll be in Abuja from Monday, Tuesday. So for the summit and for all of you register to participate and be online. Still tomorrow, you can still tell somebody to join. You can still get your staff that you did not register to participate. Yeah, they, a lot is still, tomorrow is loaded. Come on. See you tomorrow. I love you. Right. You, can, you can just open your video and say hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Apostle D4. Bye. Bye. Yes. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 We appreciate you. Thank you, D4. God bless you. It's loaded. It's great. It's all education all around. Thank you. Thank you. Business education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow will be better, I tell you. You can get more people to come in. It will be better. Man, tomorrow will be even much loaded. Thank you. See you tomorrow. You can log out now. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone.